All right. Good morning. Today is Thursday, June 18th. Uh, we are rapidly approaching our next exam with just a week's worth of material to cover over the next two days, which again, crazy. Welcome to summer school. Uh, we are going to continue our discussion of tissues by talking about connective tissues. And then once we have that, uh, we can start putting our epithelial tissues and connective tissues together uh, to make our membranes. And so that is what we're going to be doing. Uh, once we've done that, we can then move on finally to our first organ system, the integumentary system. So we should get a chance to start talking the anatomy of that today. And like last class, we will do a little histology with our lab portion as well. You have three more assignments to do uh, tomorrow. Your unit six review is due. Uh, again, both parts, the check your recall and check your understanding. So make sure you're completing both of those parts. Uh, some people haven't been turning in all of the pages. So make sure, again, I purposely uh, put the page numbers, but it's really simple. All of the uh, reviews have two parts, a check your recall and a check your understanding. Make sure you are completing all of the activities for that for all of the points. Oh, quick question. Yes. Uh, review five, page 130 it's uh it's blank yes so not, uh, okay. because what it it's the assignment i mean the lab manual is workbook like they okay. want both to check your recall and check your understandings to start on a first page uh so that's why there's that blank in between it's that blank in between is the separation between the check your recall and check your understanding so they just because uh, i guess some people might not um uh, require both parts of the review. So they make sure that both parts of the review start on their own separate pages that can be torn out. So that's why you sometimes will see a gap in the page that way. Right? Yeah, and it was weird because the, it didn't label it at the bottom, page 130. So that confused the crap out of me. I understand. But again, uh, especially if you do an electronic version, they still have kept maintained that on there, uh, those blank pages. But when you have the physical book, it makes more sense. Right, right. Um, Yep, and then remember also your epithelial tissue and connective tissue handouts are due with their labor labels uh, tomorrow as well, as well as that fun uh, take home fingerprint activity where you're gonna be doing that as well. All leading up to uh, Monday when we have our lab and lecture exam. And again, remember you only have the class time to be able to complete those. All right, there also, I got caught up on the homework uh, on my grading yesterday and there are a couple of uh, homework notes that I wanna make sure uh, I point out to you. Um, Again, as I said, uh, the point of this is to make it a workbook. The point of these things are to make it a, an assignment that uh, helps you to study. Is it going to be a good study tool that is going to help you to be successful on this? And part of doing that is actually labeling the activities. I don't want you using numbers or letters to label it, with taking the list of things, putting one, two, three, four, five, and then labeling the picture one, two, three, four, five. I want you writing out the labels or using color codes or anything along those lines. Uh, again, I know on these first couple of reviews, there's only been one or two pictures to label, but especially as we start to move on into the organ systems, uh, the check your recall is gonna become very uh, image and labeling activity dense. And so it is important to be doing those and doing those correctly uh, for full credit. If you're not labeling those things properly, you will start losing points for doing those things uh, on the assignments. I also have been very flexible with the due dates up to this point in time uh, because I know uh, it takes us some time to get up to speed, to get all the resources, to understand the responsibilities. Uh, but starting next week, when we start with the next uh, a, a section, I will start enforcing those due dates. And remember, if something is late, and by late, I mean not turned in before the beginning of class. If you end up turning an assignment in at 8.15, on the day that it is due, after a lecture has already started, that is still considered late. Uh, the good news is you can turn in late assignments. You can turn in late assignments up to one week late, but a late assignment, whether it's five days late or five minutes late, is only half credit. And I have not been enforcing that because like I said, I understand the challenges that we've had with this online and getting it up to speed on all of these things. But starting next week with the next section, I will be enforcing uh, those due dates. So you will start losing points if you're not turning things in on time. So make sure you're paying attention to those due dates. Again, everybody should have their resources now and so should be able to successfully complete all of these things. The last thing I wanted to point out is again, I wanna remind you about the Labster. With the Labster activities, you have to do the entire activity, so you have to complete 100% of the activity. But remember, you also have to get 80% of the assignment correct. As long as you get 80% of the assignment correct or more, you will get full credit for it. 
if you are not completing it for 80% correct, you are not getting full credit for that. You are only getting a prorated grade based on the percentage that you got. Now, again, remember, you can do these activities again. So if you did not complete it at an 80% the first time, uh, and you see you don't have a score of 20 for it, then go back and do it a second time. But get that done by next week, because like I said, after that, then I will start considering them late assignments. So you have through this weekend, to the beginning of next week, if you haven't done so already, and again, Again, it's a good way to study for the exam as well. Make sure that you go back and complete those with at least 80% correct. And if you get it at least 80% correct, uh, you will get full credit for that activity. So there are a couple of you that did it once, didn't get 80%, but didn't do it a second time. I'm reminding you to go back and do that a second time. All right. So those are the announcements and everything else. Any questions on any of that? All right, excellent, perfect then. In that case, we can switch gears and let's dive back into lecture. So I told you we wouldn't always be taking 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go through all the introductory stuff. Eventually we'd get it in gear and figure out what we were doing. All right, we left off last time and we had talked about our epithelial tissues. We had talked about the characteristics of epithelial tissues, characteristics that they all shared, right? They're superficial, they're cell dense, they're avascular. Right? Uh, we talked about how we identify them by the shape of the cells and the, uh, and the number of layers and things along those lines. Well, now we need to do the same thing about connective tissues. We have to talk about connective tissue first in general, characteristics that all connective tissues have and share. And then uh, we will also talk about specific connective tissues as well. Now, connective tissues are by far the most abundant, and the most widely distributed of the tissues. And as we talked about last time, they're also the most diverse of all the tissues. Again, the two examples that I gave were bone and blood, right? We have, those are two tissue types that are dynamically different from each other, but are both connective tissues. So being the most diverse, they are going to be very diverse in their functions as well. Right? As we talked about with a name like connective tissue, their job is to support and bind and protect things, connect them and hold them together. But they also store energy. They also provide for our body defenses. Uh, they can also uh, provide for all sorts of other numerous things, transportation and all sorts of other functions that these connective tissues can have. So rattling off the functions is almost meaningless because there's so many different types uh, that are gonna have so many different functions. So it's gonna be more important to know what each individual tissue does for us. And so when we talk about functions, we'll talk about them for each specific connective tissue. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't characteristics that connective tissues all have in common, right? One characteristic that all connective tissues have in common is that they are deep tissues, right? These tissues, there's my text, there it is. These are deep tissues, right? If your connective tissue is showing, see a doctor immediately, right? Because of this, they don't have an apical surface. They don't have a polarity. They have no free service, right? There's no polarity. Remember, as we talked about with our, um, as we talked about with our epithelial tissues, especially like ones that have microvilli or something like that on the top, if you took that cell and turned it upside down, it's going to completely change the function of that tissue. Now, is that same thing going to be true for bone? If I were to take a small, tiny cube of bone out of your bone and rotate it uh, 90 degrees and stick it back in there, would it dramatically change the function of how your bones work, how your skeletal system worked? Mm -hmm. Or let's take an, e let's take an even more uh, ridiculous example. If I were to draw a drop of blood out of your left arm and put it into your right arm, would that change how the blood functioned? No, there's no polarity to connective tissues. They don't have that same type of uh, dynamic surfaces or ranges. One side isn't dynamically different from the other. They're much more amorphous that way. All right, now, like epithelial tissues, connective tissues are innervated. Remember, innervated means that they have nerves in them, right? Anybody in here uh, broken a bone before? Using your participation, give me yeses and noes. Yes. Yeah, I got no. one yes. Got uh, 
couple of no's, one more yeses, a lot of no's. Excellent. Right. Okay. Now, for those of you who have broken a bone, was it an enjoyable experience for you? Painful. Yeah, no, exactly. Because there are plenty of nerves in there. Right. So absolutely. So there are plenty of nerves uh, and it does. Uh, and so it is innervated like epithelial tissues. However, unlike epithelial tissues, connective tissues are mostly right. And there's, of course, that key pesky word again, are mostly well vascularized. Now, of course, mostly means not all. There are going to be some connective tissues that are poorly vascularized, and there are going to be others that are actually avascular, like epithelial tissues. So most are well vascularized, but, uh, but others are not. Now, when we talk about connective tissues, why does vascularization matter? Why does vascularization with connective tissues? Why do you think we Is care? it because we need oxygen? True, absolutely. All tissues need oxygen, absolutely. But remember, our epithelial tissues need oxygen too. And they're avascular and they're able to get the, the oxygen that they need via diffusion and other things. So yeah, and what, what, but you were right. It's about oxygen and why might oxygen be important? Why is how much oxygen a tissue get matter? Doesn't it die without oxygen? Yeah, uh, true. It's going to die without oxygen. It's going to die without nutrients. True, absolutely. But it goes beyond that as well. All right, let's let's take it uh, out of this and into a more hypothetical realm. Again, back in ancient times, there was a thing called football. Right, football was played every Sunday, and again, everybody cared because everybody had their fantasy football teams. And uh, your first round pick's always going to be that important running back. And the very first week of the season, your running back breaks his femur, the largest bone in his body. He breaks that bone in his body. How long is that running back out for? How many weeks are you in a cast or you with, an, with a broken bone? Some of you, yeah, six weeks, maybe eight, something like that, 68 weeks. Excellent, right? That's what they're out for. Even the biggest, largest bone in your body, only out for a couple months right? What if instead that running back tears the cartilage in his knee, right? Well, how long is he out for then? Maybe a year or he may be done. He may be flipping burgers at that point, right? Cartilage is one of those things that doesn't heal well. If instead he te tears his Achilles tendon or his anterior cruciate ligament, he tears one of those ligaments or tendons, how long is he out for? Right? a year or two, something like that. Notice these tissues heal at different rates, not because of the size of them, but their blood supply. The more blood we have going to a tissue, yes, the more oxygen and nutrients that it's going to get, but that also means that the faster it's going to heal as well. Bone is very well vascularized. It's a very dynamic tissue and it grows back very, very quickly. Right? Ligaments are very poorly vascularized, and so they take much longer to heal. And cartilage is avascular. When you tear your cartilage, it is very, very slow to heal, if it ever fully heals properly again. Right? So again, that vascularization is going to be a big difference for how these tissues are going to repair. All right. Now, there are some other key characteristics about connective tissues that are important. Remember we talked about how epithelial tissues are cell dense, packed filled with cells, forming lots of layers, so much so that there's really not room for much of anything else, all right? Well, that is not the case with connective tissues. For the most part, again, there's that pesky word mostly, for the most part, most connective tissues have few cells and a lot more stuff inside of them. So when we talk about connective tissues, connective tissues really have three basic elements in them that make them up. Obviously the first one are cells. This thing uh, is cells, it's a tissue, tissues are made of cells, it has to have cells. But the other things that we are gonna have are we are going to have fibers, and we are gonna have this material we call ground substance. 
And these two things together are non-cellular components, right? So these things are things that are not cells. And we have a fancy name for that not cell stuff. The fancy name for the not cell stuff, the fibers and the ground substance together, we call the inorganic matrix. And one of the important things to realize is that the matrix of the connective tissue determines its structure and its function. Right. Again, bone is a connective tissue. Its matrix is basically calcium crystals. It makes them hard, it makes them protective, it makes them inflexible. The matrix of blood, basically water. It's the plasma. So it is the characteristics of our matrices that determine what the this connective tissue is gonna look like and what the connective tissue can do. All right, let's talk about some of these components. Starting first with the cells. Now, every single cell of a connective tissue comes from a pluripotent stem cell. Remind me again what a pluripotent stem cell is? Well, you can start with the stem cell part if that's easier. What is a stem cell? Silence. It's, it's more like a neutral cell that doesn't have a function yet. Right, okay, it's an undifferentiated cell. It doesn't have a function yet. And remember, it's also gonna divide rapidly to produce lots of new cells, right? So exactly, able to make more, able to make a lot more of these cells. What does it mean to be pluripotent? Pluripotent, uh, excellent, I like that. Diverse in classification, I like that. Uh, what pluri, that's kind of correct, but we can probably be a little more precise in our definition. Remember when we talked about stem cells, when stem cells divide, they produce new cells. And those new cells can become things. Remember something that is unipotent, like the ones we'll talk about in our skin, those new cells can only become one thing. However, a pluripotent stem cell can become a diverse, different classifications of things, multiple things. They have the possibility to become multiple things. These mesenchymal cells are special cells, pluripotent stem cells that you have in your body that are going to allow you to make any of the new uh, connective tissue cells that you need. If you need new bone, it can make bone cells. If you need new cartilage, it can make cartilage cells. It can make fibroblasts. It can make all the different types of cells that we need for all of our connective tissues. So every single cell in a connective tissue in your body, no matter what type of connective tissue it is, it starts as this mesenchymal stem cell. Question? Yes. The uh, pluripotent uh, stem cell, mm -hmm. Does it? can it become anything at all or does it have a limit? It has a limit. Remember the, the stem cells that can become anything, remember are the omnipotent ones. An omnipotent stem cell is one that uh, it can become any different type of cell of the body. Every single cell in the body they can become. Pluripotent means that there are just some. These can become any cell associated with a connective tissue, but they can't become a, st a skin cell. They can't become a liver cell. They can't become a brain tissue cell. So there are some things that can become, but they cannot become everything. All right, now, when talking about cells of the connective tissues, typically they come in two forms. There are the immature cells and the mature cells. Immature cells typically end with the uh, suffix blast, and immature cells are the ones that are responsible for building the matrix. Mature cells end in the suffix sites, and their responsibility is to maintain the matrix. So which of these two do you think are more active? Immature cells or mature cells? Immature. 
immature absolutely it's a lot harder it takes a lot more work to build the connective tissue than it does to maintain that connective tissue absolutely so immature cells are typically the more active cells and again we can see all sorts of different examples of this for instance we can have fibroblasts and fibrocytes what do you think fibroblasts and fibrocytes are responsible for making and maintaining uh, fibrocytes maintain the matrix and the fibroblast uh, makes the fibers? Yeah, the, both, exactly, right. These are responsible for the fibers. Fibroblasts make the fibers, fibrocytes maintain the fibers, right? Remember, connective tissues have lots of fibers in them, so that's what this is going to do. Chondroblasts and chondrocytes are associated with making and maintaining what? What does chondro refer to? Do you guys remember? Like hypochondriac, what did the chondro refer to in hypochondriac? Cartilage, excellent. So chondroblasts make cartilage, chondrocytes maintain cartilage. Osteoblasts and osteocytes, what are those gonna be responsible for? Bone, perfect, excellent. Adipoblasts and adipocytes, what are those gonna be associated with? Lipid? Yeah, lipids, absolutely. This is our fat tissue, fatty tissue, right? This is our fat, our adipose, our, our subcutaneous fat in places like that that were produced. And on and on and on. There's lots of examples of this. Now, again, as we know, anatomists hate us, so they always throw us curveballs. So there could be other types of cells like mast cells or macrophages and, you know, uh, other white blood cells, red blood cells, things along those lines. But in general, a lot of the cells tend to be blasts and sites. And those tend to be, like I said, the immature ones that make and are responsible for building the tissue and the site that are responsible for maintaining it. Is it possible to scroll up just a little bit? I can see the bottom writing there. I haven't written anything on the bottom. You can't see lymphocytes. I, I, uh, I don't know what the screen shows, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't move the slide up at all. So oh, okay. This is okay, lymphocytes no and et cetera on the bottom. Okay. I haven't written anything else. All righty. Uh, clear this. All right, excellent. So those are the cells. Let's talk about the fiber components. Fibers are what provide the strength and the support for our uh, connective tissues. And there are primarily three main types of fibers that are gonna be found in our connective tissues. Uh, the first is collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are made up of collagen protein which makes sense because if you remember correctly, collagen, as we said, is by far the most uh, common protein found in the body. So like I said, if you were to reach in the body and randomly pull out a protein, it is almost certainly going to be a collagen protein. Remember, we actually talked about collagen fibers when we were talking about that tensile strength. Uh, let me, where's my drawing? Remember we talked about how these collagen fibers are long strands that are kind of interwoven with each other. Like a rope. Or actually the, the example that I love about this the most is if you ever go see a, a suspension bridge, if you've ever gone to like, for instance, the Golden Gate Bridge and been able to get up close, from a distance, it looks like, you know, if you look at the Golden Gate Bridge, there are the two support towers, and then you have this big cable looking thing that suspends off of them. And from a distance, it looks like a single cable. But when you get up close, you see that that one cable is made up of all of these individual bundles. So we have these tiny little threads that have bundled together in bundles, and then those bundles are bundled together as well. And again, it resists those shearing and tearing force, uh, forces, that tensile strength, like a rope. It's kind of made in a similar way as the rope. We have this long linear uh, fiber called a collagen fiber. And as we talked about, that's what helps to hold our skin together. We have that ability to give that Indian burn and it doesn't tear off, right? Collagen has that tensile strength to it, all right? And it's made of those collagen proteins. The second type of fiber is an elastic fiber, right? Again, when we're talking about the skin, not only can we rub it without it tearing apart, but I can also grab it, pinch it, pull it away. And when I let go, 
it goes back to place, right? I can grab my kids by the scruff of their necks, carry them around the house, right? release them. And by the time Child Protective Services gets there, right, the skin has gone back to the place that it was before. And the reason for that is our skin also has a large number of elastic fibers in them. These elastic fibers are made up of a protein called elastin. And elastic allows for stretchability and it's got a strength to it. And it also, again, has, like the name would indicate, elasticity. Right? Where basically it can be stretched without damage. Now, are there limits to how long we can stretch it without damage? I don't have a rubber band here. We usually have a lot of rubber bands in the classroom and I'm able to stretch that rubber band out and I let it go and it goes back to its original shape, All right? But is it possible to stretch that a rubber band to a point beyond its elasticity where it's going to break? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Can you do the same thing to your skin as well? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, his senior year in high school, he grew 12 inches. He gained a whole foot in height his senior year in high school. And with such rapid, massive growth, one of the things that ended up happening is he stretched his skin past its elasticity, and he has some stretch marks on the side of his uh, torso because of that right? Uh, pregnancy is another example. When you suddenly in a nine month period of time grow a basketball inside of your body, that can sometimes stretch the skin beyond its uh, comfort of elasticity and can cause stretch marks to occur because of that as well, right? So absolutely, there are limits to this elasticity, but for the most part, it's fairly elastic. Lastly, the third one we have are reticular fibers. Now, what's interesting is reticular fibers are also made of collagen proteins. They also use collagen as their proteins. However, what's different about the reticular fibers are how, how those collagen proteins are arranged. In a reticular fiber, instead of long coils, and I'll draw those again for my collagen uh, fiber, Instead of long linear rope-like structures, with a reticular fiber, what we have is that the fibers are very short and elaborately branched. So there's all these big elaborate branches that are coming off of these very short fibers. What this does is it produces a very soft and very spongy tissue. Reticular fibers in particular are found places like your bone marrow, like your liver, like your spleen, like your lymph nodes. These are tissues where we want to store a lot of material inside of them. So having these elaborately branched fibers give us a very soft, very spongy tissue with a lot of space inside that we can fill with important things. So we have three main types of fibers that are used to form uh, parts of our matrix that make up our connective tissues. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Uh, so that's cells, that's fibers. Let's talk next about the uh, ground substance. Ground substance is mostly water. And basically, it is the part that holds the cells and fibers together, provides the support, provides the binding of these things. And because it's water and so many things in our body are polar in nature, this water is also where the exchange of, of, uh, of uh, materials is going to take place. Uh, this is also where uh, all the chemical reactions take place. And any chemical reaction that takes place outside of the cell is going to occur in the tissue within the ground substance uh, within that as well. Now, uh, again, your ground substance is primarily water, water outside of the cells. So our interstitial fluid, it is the water within the tissues. But there's a whole bunch of other things in here as well. Your book actually has a really nice table 
that uh, rattles off all of the different things that could possibly be in your ground substance. Rather than sit here and rattle all of them off, I do want to talk just about a couple of and highlight just a few of them. Uh, there are a large number of polysaccharides. Remember, these are big sugars. As we talked about, those are going to make these things sticky and help to uh, attach and adhere this tissue to each other. Um, oops, there we go. Lots of proteins. There are going to be lots of proteins. And again, as you read through your table, you'll see lots of examples. One of the more interesting ones that I want to talk about is an adhesion protein called fibronectin. What's interesting about fibronectin is that it is a water-soluble protein fiber. Remember, we said that all connective tissues have to be made up of cells and matrix, and that matrix has to be made up of fibers and ground substance. All right? If you had a bucket of blood sitting here in front of you, right, and you reached in and with your hands and pulled it around, would you be able to pull any fibers out of that? Are there any fibers that you notice and see inside of your blood? No. No. And the reason for that is because the primary fiber in the plasma of our blood is this water-soluble fiber called fibronectin. And most of the time, hopefully, you never see it. However, when it does become important, is when you cut yourself. Because when you cut yourself, what happens, as we talked about before, you get that positive feedback process where you're gonna get a platelet plug. But then the next thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna form a clot and it's gonna form a scab. And part of that clot and scabbing process is a process where this fibronectin, because of the chemicals that are released by the damaged tissue, because of the chemicals that are released by uh, the platelets, that fibronectin is, trans is converted into what we call fibrin. And fibrin is a water insoluble fiber. So what happens is that fiber comes out of solution, helping to form the clot, helping to form the scab, helping that to be able to heal. So the only time that that fibronectin comes out of solution is when you're injured and you need to repair yourself. So it's a very, very important, um, protein for that reason. But like I said, there are lots of examples and many that are unique to uh, each particular tissue. Cartilage has a lot of glucosamine, for instance, and so on and so forth. Like I said, your book has a nice table. Read through it. Make sure you understand the different types of things that can be ground substances. All right. Questions on that? All right, we'll talk more about the components of each individual connective tissue as we go through the connective tissues. Unlike epithelial tissues where it's more structured, we have simple, we have complex, I mean simple, we have stratified, uh, we have the different shapes and things like that. There really isn't a meaningful way to, or actually I guess there's no one meaningful way to categorize our are connective tissues. So a simple one, one that your book uses in many other ways that you described, is to go from the most rigid to the softest. And again, this is completely arbitrary. This isn't the only way you could uh, categorize your uh, connective tissues, but it's as good a starting point as any. Obviously, as we've hinted at, bone is going to be the most rigid of our connective tissues. That is going to go next to cartilages. Then we have next what we call dense or fibrous connective tissues. I'm not sure why both of those came up at the same time, but okay, whatever. Um, dense connective tissues. Dense connective tissues are also sometimes called fibrous connective tissues. Why do you think a dense connective tissue would also be called a fibrous connective tissue? Because it's full of fibers? Yeah, because it's densely packed with fibers, exactly. So you may use either term, dense connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, heck, put them together for all I care. Dense fibrous connective tissue, I'm fine with that either way. Uh, after that, we have loose connective tissues and those loose connective tissues are gonna have more cells and fewer fibers in it. That's the difference between the dense and the loose. And then the last, our softest of our tissues is blood. So like I said, let's go through each of these general types. And for each of them, there are gonna be specific types. There are two specific types of bone. There are three specific types 
of cartilage, three specific types of dense connective tissues, three specific types of loose connective tissues, and there's only one blood. So there you go. So let's talk about uh, the general types, talk about the specific examples, where you'd find them, what their anatomy, what the difference of them is. Let's talk about connective tissues. All right. And again, your book's got a pretty figure that talks about all about us. Let's start first talking about bone connective tissue. Now, bone connective tissue can be oh, connective tissue. Uh, can be a little tricky because bone connective tissue is not the same thing as a bone. Bones, remember, are organs, right? And as we talked about, you have 206 named bones in your body. And yes, bones are mostly made of bone connective tissue. So bones, the organs, are primarily made up of bone connective tissue. However, if that gets a little confusing for you, you are also welcome to use the term osseous tissue. Osseous tissue is just another fancy name for bone connective tissue. Now, as I mentioned, it comes in two flavors. Those two flavors are compact bone and cancellous bone, which is also called spongy bone. And again, both of those are appropriate anatomical terms. For this exam, we are going to focus solely on compact bone. When we get to the skeletal system in the next section, then we will talk about compact bone and spongy bone, and you will have a lot more histology you will be responsible for. At this point right now, what we're going to focus solely on is our compact bone, which is the bone you see over here. And let me use my highlighter again, change the color. One of the keys with compact bone, if you notice, compact bone is made up of these circular patterns of cells and matrix. This circular pattern of cells and matrix is essentially the organizing structure, and let's write this here. Is the organizing structure of compact bone and we call that structure an osteon. So if you see that osteon, this circular shaped structure of matrix and cells, this circular structure of matrix and cells is what we call an osteon. And if you see an osteon, you know you are looking at compact bone. All right, we'll talk more about the anatomy of it when we do our histology. Uh, but again, this, these are the shapes that you want to be able to recognize. Notice also, and I'll grab my highlighter again and change the color a second time. At the center of these osteons are these hollow spaces. These hollow spaces, as you can see, are what are referred to as the central canals. And any idea what might be in those central canals? Is it like those bone sites maybe to produce more bones not or something? A, not a bad guess. We definitely need spaces for, yep, we definitely need spaces for cells. But we'll talk about those in a second. No, Edna's right. It's blood vessels, blood vessels and nerves. Remember, as we talked about, it hurts like heck when you break that bone. Uh, but also bone is incredibly dynamic. I know it's hard to think of it that way because normally when we think of a skull or a bone, we think of holding that bone in this hand and we're looking at it dead. When it's dead, it's clearly not dynamic anymore, but your bone connective tissue is highly dynamic, constantly changing, constantly growing, con heals very rapidly because it is very well vascularized. All right, where the cells live is in these tiny little spaces here and here and here and here and here and here. These little tiny spaces are the caves that our bones uh, cells live in. Again, if you think about this, bone is a has a solid matrix that is primarily made up of calcium salts, uh, salt crystals. All right, so it is a solid material, but cells need to be able to live in that. 
right? Think of it this way. Bears live in mountains. If you have a mountain, a bear has to live somewhere inside of there. And where is it going to live? It's going to live inside of a cave. And that's what these little black spots we see are. These little black spots that we see are the caves that the cells live in. So the black spot, the hole, the space, let's use the term we'll use on the exam, is what is known as a lacuna. Lacuna being the singular, lacunae being the plural. And the cell that lives in the space are going to be the mature bone cell. And if it's a mature bone cell, what do we call it? What do we call the mature bone cells? It's like two slides ago. Oocytes? Yeah. Right. Osteocytes. Excellent. So we're osteocytes, singular. Osteocytes, plural, are the cells that live in that space. So again, on the exam, especially if we were looking at this magnification, if I pointed here, do you actually really see the cell that's in there? Do you see the cell that that arrow is pointing at? No. No, I don't see it either, right? But what I would ask on the exam with an arrow pointing at that space like that, I could ask one of two questions. I could ask you to identify the space and you would and say lacuna, or I could ask you to identify the cell that would be located in that space, and you would say that that is the osteocyte. Okay? So here is our compact bone. This is what it looks like. I'm going to go ahead. Well, actually, I'll leave the color stuff, but I need to get rid of, where's my eraser? That and that. Excellent. So, I, oops. My control. There we go. Excellent. So, our bone is made up of the solid matrix with spaces in them called lacunae that the uh, cells are going to live in. Now, as I mentioned, the matrix is mostly made up of that calcium salt crystals, but bone also has a large amount of collagen fibers in them as well. This is important to realize because remember, one of the nice things about our bones is they do have a little flexibility and give, right? When you jump up and down, you're putting a lot of pressure on your bone, but your bone doesn't snap as a result of that. What the collagen fibers do is give the bone some flexibility and give. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the best example of this involves both our bones and another substance that we have as well, and that is the enamel of your teeth. Both your bones, enamel of teeth, are made up of these calcium uh, carbonate, calcium phosphate, uh, magnesium, some other things that are all put together to form a very special crystal called a hydroxyapatite crystal. These hydroxyapatite crystals are the hardest substance that is produced by the human body. And we use it to make our bones and we use it to make the enamel of our teeth, all right? Now, as I said, bone has collagen fibers that give it some twist, give it some flexibility, give it some give. So they have that hydroxyapatite crystals and fibers. Your enamel just has that crystal. It makes it really, really, really hard, but unfortunately, without the collagen fibers, it's also a little uh, brittle as well, right? Because here you are, as that Patriots fan, now that the mighty cheater, uh, Tom Brady, has left to go to Tampa Bay, you're drowning your sorrows in a big bowl of New England clam chowder, and you bite on a clamshell. And as you bite on that clamshell, does that enamel of your teeth have any give, have any flexibility? No. Yeah. No, it doesn't, right? And so what happens is you end up breaking that enamel. It doesn't have any give, it doesn't have any flexibility, right? Whereas our bones have that give, have that flexibility because they have that collagen fiber in them. All right? All right, like I said, we'll talk about the rest of the histology of that when we look at that on the pretty picture. I have a question. Yes. Um, so, like when they say that enamel erodes, is that a breakdown of these fibers or is it like? Well, remember, like so two things. Remember, enamel doesn't have fibers. Enamel just has the crystals, okay? 
So we'll start with that. But yes, what ha when they talk about your enamel wearing down, what happens is it's the same thing if you think about it, if you have uh, a big rock out in your front yard, as the rain con constantly hits it and the sun and the wind, eventually the top part of that gets worn away. And that's what happens to the, uh, the crystals of your teeth as well as you're constantly grinding, constantly using them, constantly tearing their can or, you know, drinking a lot of coffee or acidic wine or things along those lines. Uh, you can get an eroding of the enamel of the teeth from that as well. And that's just from wear and tear. But it's the crystals that are moving away. There are no fibers in the enamel. Remember, the enamel doesn't have fibers. That's why it doesn't have any flexibility. That's why it doesn't have any give. Thank you. Yep. Great question. Any others? All right, let's move from bone to cartilage. There are some similarities in cartilage and bone. Uh, the main way they are similar to each other is both have a solid matrix. So the matrix is completely solid. So again, because of that, what that means is if the cells are going to live inside of it, and most certainly the cells are gonna live inside of it, then those cells need a space. So what do you think we're gonna call the space that these cells are located in? If only we had a name for a space inside of a solid matrix where a cell could live. Lacuna? Yeah, lacuna, absolutely. So notice right here, it even says it right here. Notice here, we have spaces, lacunas, that the cells live in. Now these are the cells that make cartilage, not the cells that make bone. So the big, big difference is these are gonna be chondrocytes, mature cartilage cells, as opposed to the osteocytes that are inside the lacunas of bone. So lacuna is a hole inside of a solid matrix where a cell lives. And so since both bone and cartilage are solid matrices, they both have lacunas. However, notice, the matrix in this is very thin, very clear, very uniform. Obviously, the illustration of it shows that, but even the light microscopy of it shows it as well. So while the big similarity between bones and cartilage is they both have solid matrices, the big difference between the two is that while bone is highly vascularized, our cartilage is avascular. no direct blood supply to our cartilage. You may not have thought of it in those terms, but most of you are aware of this. As we talked about, if that running back tears the cartilage in his knee, hopefully none of you have torn cartilage in your knee, but if he tears the cartilage in his knee, they can go in and remove some of it, they can shave it off, but it's not gonna grow back. And if this damage is severe enough, they're never gonna recover from that. Now that can be a little so hard to see from the outside, but there's another classic example of this damage to cartilage uh, that we see on the outside of the body, and that involves these things right here. Yes, lacunas are only found in solid matrices, that is correct. Your ears. As you know, your ear is made of cartilage as well. And in particular, wrestlers tend to take a lot of damage to their ear. Right? Sometimes you can see a guy walking down the street and without knowing anything else about him, you can look at him and tell that he's been a wrestler for a very long time. And how can you tell that? Cauliflower ear. Cauliflower ear. That's the magic thing I was looking for. What happens is that cartilage gets damaged and it is incredibly slow to heal. And the problem is he damages it on Monday and then he's back wrestling again on Tuesday. And so he's constantly damaging it, constantly doing uh, problems to it. And it can actually in extreme cases curl up and become this big, huge yellowish and bluish um, a mass. Now again, my, I wrestled in high school, mine never got that bad, but I do actually have a little bit of cauliflower ear from damage that I got to my cartilage uh, from wrestling way back in high school. And high school was 257 years ago, and yet I still have that little bit of cauliflower ear as a result of that. Cartilage heals very, very slowly because it is avascular, all right? So again, similar in some ways, a solid matrix, uh, but very, very different in that it's avascular. The other big difference is the components of the matrix. While both have solid matrices, remember as we talked about, bone is primarily uh, calcium crystals, 
Whereas here, our cartilage has a large amount of collagen in it, again, giving it some flexibility, giving it some give, and other components, like we said, uh, uh, like uh, glucosamine and some other components that may get a much more uh, um, flexible, solid material. Again, maybe you've never had cauliflower ear, you never wrestled, maybe you've never torn a, uh, you know, uh, 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 your meniscus or something like that in your body, but maybe on Saturdays you like to go to the Renaissance Fair. And of course, the whole reason you go to the Renaissance Fair is to get that big, huge, massive chicken leg. And when you get that big old massive turkey leg that you're gonna eat while you walk around, you notice at the end of the bone, there's this rubbery white stuff at the end of the bone. Or maybe you're deboning a chicken and at the end of the feet of the legs, you have that white rubbery material. That right rubbery material is the uh, cartilage. All right. Now, in particular, that cartilage that is at the end of the bones of those chicken and turkey legs that you're eating is what is known as hyaline cartilage. And that's actually what we're seeing in this picture up here as well. Hyaline cartilage. Island cartilage is the most common type of cartilage, and the easiest way to identify it is that it has a uniform matrix. Or let's be more specific. It has a clear uniform matrix. Now notice by clear, I don't mean like completely devoid of color. Notice that our picture here, the, the matrix is this beautiful pink color to it, but the key is we don't see fibers in it. That doesn't mean there aren't fibers there. There are lots of fibers, uh, both collagen, uh, mo well, let's say mostly collagen, let's say that. Mostly collagen with a little bit of elastic, but they're all dissolved. They're all dissolved into the matrix, so we don't really see them in the matrix as we look at it. So it tends to have a very clear, very uniform matrix. Highland cartilage is the most common type. As I just kind of indicated, it's going to be at the end of the bones helping to form joints so that as those bones move against each other, it reduces the friction, it reduces the wear and tear. So most of our bones have some cartilage that helps to hold them together. The other classic place, and this is a place where you can feel it, is your bridge of your nose, right? As you grab the bridge of your nose, and I'm talking about the rubbery part down here. This is all other types of fibrous connective tissues. But the bridge of your nose, your bridge of your nose, if you grab that and move that, it doesn't have any flexibility. It doesn't have any give, and that's not bone. Way up here, there's a little bit of bone, but what we commonly think of as the bridge of the nose, that is cartilage. And that's that hyaline cartilage, that rigid, rigid hyaline cartilage. Now notice, as I grab that bridge of my nose and I play with my ear, I said the ear was cartilage, but this clearly doesn't feel like this. They feel very, very different from each other. And the reason for that is your ear is made up, oh, but I guess I gotta remove that uh, writing now. That ear is made up of elastic cartilage. Notice it's cartilage. It has spaces, lacunas. Those lacunas contain chondrocytes. So that is the same. However, when you look at the matrix here, you can see the matrix is just filled to the max with these dark, thin fibers. And more specifically, these dark, thin elastic. elastic fibers. This elastic cartilage has so much elastic fibers in it that it actually gives that flexibility and that give, making it this loose rubbery material that we find in the ears. Is there anywhere else you find elastic cartilage? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the is that, the is that the same as the ACL, the PCL, or is it a different kind of cartilage? The, well, so the careful the ACL and D, uh, the ACL and PCL are actually ligaments. There is cartilage in the knee, the meniscus, the meniscus, the lateral meniscus and medial meniscus are cartilage, but are neither of these type, hyaline or elastic. They're going to actually be where we find our third type of cartilage. Uh, so there is a cartilage in there, but it's not the elastic. Where else might we find an elastic cartilage? Anyone know? 
No. Put your hand on your throat and swallow. Oh, the uh, cricothyroid membrane. Close. You're absolutely yeah. close. Yeah, here, the, that Adam's apple that you feel going up and down when you swallow is an organ called the larynx. And on the larynx is a bendable, flexible piece of cartilage made up of elastic cartilage called the epiglottis. That epiglottis, and let's write that down. That epiglottis basically folds over your airway when you swallow so that your food and drink go into your esophagus and down into your stomach instead of going in your airway. So here in that, uh, you're in your larynx, you have your epiglottis, you have your ear. Those are basically the two locations where you find your elastic cartilage, your bendable, flexible cartilage. But as was mentioned, in our knee, we have these special cushions called the menisces the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus, and they are made of a special type of connective tissue called fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage, as you can see, again, this notice it's a much higher magnification, so we're seeing the cells a little bit bigger here, but what you can see is again we have a lacuna, we have the space, we have the chondrocytes inside of those spaces, but notice again, we have fibers, so many fibers inside of this tissue that uh, the matrix is no longer uniform. Now notice there's a big difference between these fibers and the elastic fibers. Notice these fibers are thin and they're very chaotic, right? They're kind of all over the place in their orientation. Whereas here, all the fibers are much, uh, Core, more coarse, coarse fibers. Uh, of course. Uh, they're more coarse fibers. And notice they have kind of a wavy appearance where they're all kind of parallel with each other. And the reason for this is instead of elastic fibers, these are massive, 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 massive numbers of collagen fibers. All kind of run in a row. And this massive amount of collagen fibers, oh, collagen fibers, um, is going to be able to resist compression. So as we mentioned, in the knee, it acts as a shock absorber to help to protect from that wear and tear of that weight-bearing uh, weight joint that is the knee. Another place where you have your fiber college, uh, fibrocartilage is in your vertebral column. Right in between your vertebrae is your intervertebral disc. And that intervertebral disc helps to resist the compression. It acts as a shock absorber uh, so that every time you take a step, your brain isn't rattling around inside of your skull. And another major place where you find your fibrocartilage is in your pubic symphysis, right? You have your pelvis that basically is your center of balance where your legs connect. And at the very front of it where it comes together is a joint called the pubic symphysis. This pubic symphysis has fiber cartilage there that helps to give some structure and stability to our pelvis. However, as we know, uh, females get the honor and privilege of housing and giving birth to our offspring. And as such, they have to pass a basketball through that pelvis. So one of the things that happens is the hormones that are produced by a female during pregnancy soften that fibrocartilage, making it a little bit more flexible, giving it more give, yeah. making the birthing process uh, easier. Now, one of the issues associated with that is that that loosening of the fibrocartilage, remember our pelvis is also our our base of our stability, our base of our balance. And so what happens is as that fibrocartilage loosens, especially in the late stage of pregnancy, uh, females who are pregnant uh, tend to get a very distinctive gait to the way they walk. Notice I didn't say waddle, right? They have a very distinctive gait to the way that they walk uh, because of that loosening of the fibrocartilage. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Those are our cartilages. Let's talk about our dense 
or our fibrous connective tissues. Remember, you can use either terms. Again, there are three specific types. And because I have the space here right now, I will take advantage. We differentiate the three specific types by two things. First is the primary type of fiber that forms the tissue. Oops, hold on, that should be one. And the second is the orientation of the fibers. This is the way we're gonna differentiate this. All right, this is probably a good time to bring this up. Hopefully one of the things that you are noticing as we are going through it is that one of the nice things about connective tissues is because they're so diverse, because they're so different, they all look very, very different from each other. Every single connective tissue is gonna be very distinct, very different in the way it appears, and it should make it much easier to be able to tell what it is. Remember when we were looking at epithelial tissues, we had to look at the basal surface, we had to look at the apical surface, we had to try to find all these other cues to help to be able to tell them apart. It's gonna be more challenging with the epithelial tissues. The good news is with the connective tissues, it's much, much easier. Every single connective tissue looks very different than the other single connective tissue, with really just one exception. And we're going to run into this right here, but I will give you the keys to help you to be able to distinguish them. All right? So, the types of fibers and the orientation of the fibers. Let's talk about the orientation of the fibers first. One way fibers can be oriented, and I'm just going to use lines because it's more convenient for me is that they can be parallel to each other. If they are parallel to each other, we refer to them as being regular. And the advantage of being regular is these fibers provide a tremendous amount of protection, but they provide that tremendous amount of protection in the orientation of the fibers, right? Someone just mentioned a few moments ago, our ACL and our uh, PCL, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament found in the leg. Or another one is your patella ligament that attaches your quadricep muscles of your leg to your lower leg. Your quadricep is the largest muscle group in your body and it can produce a massive amount of force. In fact, it can produce enough force where it might potentially tear that ligament, but it turns out it doesn't. It's theoretically possible to produce enough force in your quadricep where you're pulling so much on that tendon that what you would do is actually break your tibia. It can produce enough force to break your tibia, and that's actually what would happen. You would break your tibia before you tore that patella ligament. Those fibers all running in a row provide a tremendous amount of strength. Your anterior cruciate ligament prevent, provides a tremendous amount of strength and resistance. But the issue with that is you only get the protection in the orientation of the fiber, all right? So again, that running back is pumping those legs with those massive uh, legs, those massive muscles, sprinting down the sidelines to score that touchdown. And his fibers in those ligaments or, and tendons are pretty strong to be able to support him as he's running. But then that linebacker comes in and tackles him from the side. And when he gets tackled from the side, are those fibers able to provide that protection from an, a force coming from that orientation? No. No. In fact, if you, if you look back at uh, football, and again, football is one of the classic examples of this. If you look back at football, though it, it also happens in basketball, we saw it with uh, uh, Kevin Durant, uh, for instance. Um, these athletes are becoming so large and so powerful and so strong and so fast a lot of these ACL tears or their Achilles tears, uh, tears aren't even happening from contact. What happens is they stop to pivot and as they're changing direction, they're so strong and so powerful and so fast, they're producing so much force 
that their tendons aren't able to keep up with it. And so many of these tendon and ligament tears are actually occurring from non-contact injuries. It's because their body trying to change acceleration uh, it comes with such a lateral force that it ends up tearing those ligaments. So again, these regular fibers provide massive amount of support, but only from stresses in one direction. Your skin gets stressed from all sorts of different directions. So we wouldn't want to have fibers that were oriented this way. Instead, what we would want to do is take these fibers. Wait, hold on, go back. I also want to erase that. Uh, change it back to, I think that was the green that I was using. Perfect. We want to have these fibers at all sorts of different orientations. And if we put them at all different orientations, then notice this is going to provide what we call protection from multi-axial stress because all these fibers are going at all sorts of different random directions. And when that's the case, we call this orientation irregular. All right. So when we're identifying our dense or fibrous connective tissues, we are going to do it by the direction of the fibers. They're either going to be regular or irregular and by the type of fiber. Okay. Now let's clear this and look at our three types. Starting first with a dense regular connective tissue. Notice as we can see here, it is basically parallel uh, collagen fibers that we see here. And notice also, one of the interesting things, one of the ways we are gonna be able to easily identify our um, dense regular connective tissues is because these have massive numbers of fibers in them. And if you notice, one of the interesting things is the nuclei of the fibroblasts uh, elongate and run parallel to the fibers. Notice here, where's my highlighter? that the nuclei, and again, typically we're only gonna see the nuclei of these cells, the nuclei of the fibroblasts uh, typically elongate and run parallel to the fibers. And we see that in the illustration, and we see that in the uh, draw, I mean, uh, the drawing over here and the light microscopy over here. All right, now, two issues. Issue one. Notice I wrote fibroblasts, and up here, your book said fibrocyte. Who's correct? Me or the book? You. <laughs> I do write the test, so that is usually a safe way to go by it. And so, so that is a good general rule. But in this case, we're actually both. Remember, we talked about a fibro, or let's say, blasts are immature cells and sites are mature cells. As we look, and let's actually look at the real uh, microscope slide. As we look at this cell, and let's just take the highlighter and put a dot over the top of it. As we look at this cell right here, by looking at that cell right there, can you really tell whether it's making the fiber or just maintaining the fiber? Or whether this one is making the fiber or whether this one is making the fiber? We really can't tell. So basically in our dense connective tissues, the terms fibroblast and fibrocyte are pretty much used interchangeably because there's really no way to tell which ones are the mature ones and which one are the immature cells. So they're pretty much just used interchangeably. All right, so again, so those are the ones that we can just kind of use interchangeably. Our dense regular connective tissues are primarily used to make ligaments and tendons. Now, what is the difference between a ligament and a tendon? What does a ligament do? A ligament connects a muscle to muscle. Mm, close. 
It does connect two of the same things together, but a ligament actually connects what two things together? The bone and the bone and the tendons is a muscle to muscle. There you go, bone to bone, close. Ligaments connect bone to bone, right? So ligaments connect bones to bone, whereas tendons connect muscles to what? Muscles to bone. There you go, muscles to bone, there you go, excellent. There are some small muscles that can connect from a muscle to another muscle, so they would have a tendon that would go muscle to muscle, but most tendons connect muscle to bone. All ligaments connect bones to bones. And because anatomists love to name things, most tendons are kind of ball or rope shape. But in some instances, like for instance, over the top of your head, or the classic example you see is in the abdominal region. You see like a lot of the muscle pictures in the abdominal region, a big, broad, white sheet of material. Those big, broad, white sheets of material are big, flat tendons. And of course, calling them big, flat tendon would be perfectly acceptable. But as we know, anatomists love to name everything. So the name for a large, broad, flat tendon is an aponeurosis. Aponeurosis, I, S for the singular, aponeurosis, E, S for the plural. All right, and again, you get one letter, so you could spell it either way on the exam and you get it, but eventually it's gonna be good to know the difference between singular and plural. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's talk about our second type. Oh, and I guess I have to clear all of that now. Our second type of dense or fibrous connective tissue is a dense irregular connective tissue. This one notice also is chalk filled with collagen fibers. But in this case, the difference is that the collagen fibers are very irregular in their or, 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 or random, let's say it that way, in their orientation. Notice as we look at the picture, uh, as we look at the light microscopy, we can see some fibers that you're seeing the longitudinal, some are cut in cross sections, so some are this way, some are this way, some are at angles, some are up, some are down, some are left, some are right. They're all just this amorphous mass of fibers at all sorts of different angles. And again, the advantage of this is this provides us protection from multi-directional stress. And as you can see from the illustration, the classic place you find this is in your skin. So I can stretch my skin in any direction and those collagen fibers are gonna help to keep my skin together. The last type of fibrous connective tissue is elastic. Now this is the tricky one. Elastic connective tissues and dense regular connective tissues look similar. Remember as I mentioned, one of the nice things about connective tissues is they all look very dissimilar from each other. But this is the case where these two are the ones that look closest like each other. And so these two are probably the trickiest to be able to differentiate. Notice uh, it has parallel fibers. That's what makes it look similar to the dense regular connective tissue. However, in this case, it is elastic fibers. These elastic fibers provide stretch and flexibility. Now notice like the illustration, one of the common places you find these is forming elastic ligaments of our spinal cord to help us to maintain our posture. In fact, one of the biggest locations you have them is right on the back of your neck. In fact, if you feel the back of your head, on the back of your head, you should feel a bump on the back of your head. That's one of the bone features we're gonna be learning. It's called the external occipital protuberance, but don't worry about that term. You won't have to learn that for a whole other week. Uh, but once we get there, you'll get that. Uh, that is an attachment point for this elastic ligament. If, and so the job of that is to hold your head up. So as you're listening to me lecture and you slowly start to fall asleep, right, this elastic ligament, helps you to pull your head back up. So the more you fall asleep during the lecture, the bigger that bump's gonna get. So that's that ligamentum nocha. It's the big largest of our uh, elastic ligaments helping to maintain our posture and hold our head up. 
So it's parallel fibers. Notice the fibers are a little thicker, a little more coarse. So that's one of the ways you can tell them apart. Notice also, and here's the two big key, well, here's the one of the big keys that is gonna help you yeah. distinguish them. Notice the big difference in, and I'll switch to my highlighter here, and let's use blue to really make it stand down. Remember we talked about here, notice the nuclei of the fibroblasts get very large and elongated in our dense regular connective tissue. Whereas if you notice the nuclei of our elastic, the fibroblasts of our elastic tissues, they nuclei say very small, very uh, pinprick-like. So they're very, very small and don't get large and don't elongate. So the difference in the nuclei is one of the key factors you'll use to tell them apart. The fibers tend to be thicker and more coarse, whereas these tend to be more narrow. There is a third way. However, again, remember color is one of those things that can be tricky because different stains are gonna make it appear differently. And with some stains, and here's the key word here, some stains, in some stains, these elastic fibers will appear yellowish in color. Now notice this doesn't show that. This particular stain doesn't show that. When we look at this histologically, I do have one where you'll see that yellow color to it. So it's not something you can always rely on. The nucleus is something you can always rely on if you can see those. That's always a dead giveaway if you see those but the coarseness of the fibers, and if sometimes you see a yellow color to those fibers, that yellow color is a dead giveaway. You're looking at an elastic connective tissue. Notice elastic connective tissue and elastic cartilage are not the same thing. Both have a lot of elastic fibers in it, but they're very different. All right, questions on that? So just, just to... Um identify you said the only thing you can see between the uh, dense regular connective tissue and the elastic connective tissue is just the nuclei it's um, smaller but also the the fibers tend to be a little bit more straight in their uh in their look compared to the wavy look a little bit correct yes correct <clears throat> uh, well uh, yeah they will be typically larger and have rougher edges to them too because they're going to be thicker whereas the collagen fibers tend to be much more narrow much more thin uh, okay uh, that's another great question this particular stain that we're looking at here this particular stain is a, uh, this purple stain is a stain specifically for collagen so they're using this to really highlight the fibers in this particular one. So this particular stain doesn't show the nuclei of the uh, dense irregular. However, other stains will show it. And I'll tell you right now, those that do show it, uh, they are going to be small pinprick-like nuclei, like in, the, uh, like in the elastic. The only one that has the big elongated nuclei is the dense regular. So if you see big elongated nuclei, dead giveaway, you're looking at a dense regular. So yeah, this one, this particular stain doesn't show the fibroblasts or fibrocytes. They're there, but uh, it does, this particular stain doesn't show it. Other stains will show it. All right, excellent. Great questions. Any others? All right, we are mostly done with our connective tissues, but uh, this is a good stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our first break here. Any other questions before we take our break? Uh, right. Just, uh, sorry, just a quick random question. Uh, for the homework done with the fingerprint, uh, there's nothing we need to print out, correct? No, uh, you do, well, no, you don't, there's nothing you need to print out, just use the uh, the uh, minutia of details or what they're called Galton points, uh, that map that is on your, in your lab manual on page 146. But yeah, no, just put it, put it on a piece of paper or, a, or an index card or whatever, back of your, you know, a, an envelope, whatever. I, I don't care. Just try to, try to find, try, the point of it is for you to do an exercise to try to identify um, these characteristics of a fingerprint. Gotcha. I could post pictures of fingerprints, but I think people have more fun doing it on their own. So yeah. that's the whole point of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Yeah, obviously it means that this is testable material. On the exam, I could show you a fingerprint and ask you for the general trend or ask you for the minutia of detail. And so this is the way of learning that material so you're prepared for the exam. Okay. Okay. All right, any other questions? And again, if for some reason you don't want to use your fingerprints, like I said, do a Google search, find somebody else's fingerprints. I just want to see that you've recognized and identified these pictures. All righty, let's go ahead and take our break. I see the clock says 9.20, so let's restart at 9.35. And so actually, let's switch slides because uh, this one's a mess. So there, excellent. So we will restart at 9.35 and I will start the recording. All right, I'll see you in 15 minutes. Any questions before we get rolling? All righty, let's move on then and talk about our loose connective tissues. Loose connective tissues, as the name would indicate, are called loose because they have more cells in them and they have fewer fibers. Uh, so with fewer fibers, there's more space for more stuff uh, like cells and, and ground substance and other components as well. You particularly see this here in our areolar connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue is the most widely distributed of all the connective tissues. All right, we said we said the what, connective tissues are the most widely distributed of all the tissues, and areolar is the most widely distributed of all the connective tissues. So if you were to randomly reach in the body and pull out a tissue, it's most likely going to be a areolar connective tissue. And being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, if all else fails and you don't know what to answer for a question, say a real art connective tissue because it's the most common one. Now, one of the tricks to a real art connective tissue is it is not always going to have this appearance to it, but often or frequently it can have this type of appearance when we look at it, where it has this very kind of cobwebby appearance. Let's start here looking at the real illustration of the light microscopy of it. And notice we can see it definitely contains fibers. And notice we can see it contains two types of fibers, these larger, thicker, redder fibers, and these darker, thinner, elastic fibers. So here this thin, dark fiber is an elastic fiber. These thicker, a larger fibers are collagen fibers. And they're kind of all over the place. They're irregular in their orientation. All right. And that leaves lots of spaces for stuff. Here we see plenty of nuclei. Now notice on the pretty picture here uh, from your textbook, we see what some of these cells can be. There can be all sorts of different types of cells. Pigment cells, blood vessels can be located in fat cells, uh, immune cells, all sorts of hunk and junk that can be in this space. Now, in a pretty picture like this, it's easy to tell them apart. However, as we look at the individual cells here, yeah, they're telling us this is a fibroblast and this is a macrophage, but as you, as a student at the beginning of A&P, can you tell the difference between these two nuclei or these two cells just by their nuclei or which one that is or what that is or what that is? No. So the good news is for the most part, you aren't going to be asked to distinguish the individual cells that you could find in here but you do need to know that there's going to be a lot of them. There is one, and when we do the histology, you'll see it, and we'll talk about it in more depth there. Quick question. Right. Yes. Uh, for the exam purposes, uh, the, the top picture, do we need to remember uh, all the names of the cells and everything from there? No, you don't have to memorize that picture. In fact, okay. when it comes to histology, uh, I'm these Illustrations that your textbook uses are nice, but any histology I show you on the exam is going to be one of two things. It is either going to be real light microscopy or electron microscopy, so it will be real microscope images, or there are some models that are sometimes used in the classroom that you may need to use to recognize. So, for instance, when we get to the connective tissue, uh, when we get to the skeletal system, uh, there is a histology model of a bone. When we get to the muscle system, there's a histology model of a muscle cell. So those you'll need to know. But for the most part, your histology is going to be real histology pictures and not the pretty illustrations that someone has drawn. Okay, got it. Okay. <clears throat> now, 
the other thing again is there's a lot of space for fluid and other stuff inside of this areolar connective tissue so it's kind of like the bubble wrap of the body it is going to cushion and surround and support and help to hold things in place one of the things that can hold in place is water right so again you're done with class today you're all excited you want to go for a drive in your car and you accidentally slam your hand in the car door right it's going to swell up as a result of that the reason it swells up is because this areolar connective tissue all this space inside of it can be a reservoir for water and salts to fill that area and of course that swelling of the tissue we call edema and if you think about it is there a part of your body that if you hurt it it wouldn't swell up in size can you think of any part of your body that if you hurt it it wouldn't swell up and become inflamed and enlarged no. Bone. Yeah. And the reason for that, well, okay, the bone itself, maybe, yes, if you bruise the bone, the bone wouldn't swell up inside, but would you get a big, huge bump in front of it as a result of that? Probably. Yeah. yeah because yeah. pretty much, like I said, you have a real art connective tissue everywhere. It's pretty much everywhere. Question. But yes. if you, like you mentioned, if you hit the bone, don't you have bone that grows on top of that? Well, not bone that grows on top of it, but you have other tissues on top of that. You don't have, if you're going to hurt a bone, you have to hurt other tissue to hurt that bone in between. You can't really just hurt the bone and not hurt the other tissues in between. So right, yes, right. the bone, it's, so you're right. The bone itself would not, um, uh, the bone itself would not um, uh, swell. Uh, although we will talk about how you heal a broken bone and there can be some swelling in that uh, because of the uh, hematoma that forms the blood that forms from the burst blood vessels. But the tissues on top of it would swell as a result of that from that edema, from that damage. All right. Now, one of the things that can happen with an areolar connective tissue is an areolar connective tissue can fill with adipocytes. And if it fills with adipocytes, right, or fat cells, if it fills with those adipocytes, then basically it becomes adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, like remember we said loose connective tissues don't have a lot of fibers, they have a lot of cells, and this one is almost exclusively cells. Very little matrix in between of them. It actually makes it very easy to be able to recognize, as you'll see, uh, it kind of has this kind of what always appears kind of like chicken wire appearance to me, where you have these thin cells and it is very typically very, very clear on the inside. Again, color is one of those things we always want to be careful about. But in this case, adipocytes contain a special uh, organelle that is basically a fat vacuole. Basically, it's a big oil droplet. And this oil droplet basically swells and fills the cell. One of the things that we can see clearly, switch to my highlighter here, is that these are cells that have nuclei. But notice, and they've done a really nice job of our drawing of showing this, the nucleus is always shoved to the side. And the reason it's shoved to the side is because it has this huge, massive oil droplet inside of it. It's often referred to as what they call the diamond ring shape, because you have this cell and the nucleus basically gets shoved to the side by this huge vacuole, this huge oil droplet that basically fills the cell. And so it kind of has what they call this diamond ring type of appearance. What, <coughs> excuse me. This oil fat, uh, droplet inside of our adipocyte is very dynamic. It is constantly shedding some of these and constantly taking on more. It's constantly dynamic. But in general, what ends up happening is that these cells are incapable of dividing. So what happens is if your caloric intake is greater than uh, your caloric output, then those extra calories are gonna be stored inside these cells as that oil and the cell expands and gets larger. If the, uh, your caloric output is greater than your caloric intake, 
then what's going to happen is those fats need to be used. They will be expressed from the cell and the cell is going to shrink in size. So these cells are able to change their size, get larger or get smaller based on how much oil they're storing, how much energy they're storing based on your caloric input and output. All right. Now, being not only the sophisticated students that we are, but the sophisticated individuals as organisms that we are. As we've talked about humans, one of the main reasons we want to learn about the body is so that we can use it to our advantage. Because of course, as everyone here knows, the most important number one thing that matters most in life is that you are beautiful on the outside. Nobody cares what you like on the inside, but being beautiful on the outside allows you to become TikTok famous, and there's nothing more important than becoming TikTok famous, so we all need to be beautiful on the outside. Now, knowing that about these cells that they are not capable of dividing, right, that's great, but the problem is I like cheeseburgers, so I eat 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, 17 more for lunch, and 17 more for dinner. Right, that's obviously a tremendous caloric intake, much more than my poor little adipocytes or my poor little body can use. So my adipocytes are swelling up. So being the sophisticated doctor that I am, I decided to go to uh, a cosmetic surgeon who's got this very fancy machine, which is essentially a vacuum cleaner. And they stick this vacuum cleaner in underneath my skin and they suck out all of those adipocytes. What do they call that process? Liposuction or something? Liposuction, absolutely, right? And they suck all the cells out of me and now I'm beautiful and I can become TikTok famous. And the best part is because those cells are gone and those cells can't divide, I can go back to eating 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and I'm never gonna get fat, right? No. Why not? Because those yeah. cells come back. How? The cells don't divide. Now, okay, you're right. When they have that hose, they're in there, and typically they're not able to remove all the cells. So some cells will remain. But let's take it one step even more ridiculously and extreme. Let's say that they have a new liposuction vacuum cleaner that 100% removes all the adipocytes. So there are no adipocytes remaining. If you have no adipocytes at all underneath your skin, can you eat cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner 17 at a time and never worry about getting fat? No. No, why not? You guys clearly know the answer. Absolutely, the answer is no. I will get fat again, but how? Why? If these cells can't divide or if I remove them all, then how possibly could they come back? Doesn't your body react yes. and, and know that you, you need like some kind of cushion or protection or something like that? True, but I've removed all those cells. Someone also had an answer. What was somebody else was saying something? Because you don't stop producing them. But how, how, if they don't divide, how can I produce them? Excess energy. Energy is stored as adipose tissue. True, but to have adipose tissue, I have to have adipose cells. And if I've removed all my adipose cells, then how do I get adipose tissue again? From your stem cells, because they will Bingo. create everything. There you go. Remember, as we talked about, we have those mesenchymal stem cells. Yes, adipocytes cannot divide to produce new adipocytes. But remember, our mesenchymal stem cells are those pluripotent stem cells that produce all of the cells of our connective tissue. Well, so what, what happens triggers, is, I'm sorry? Uh, what triggers the stem cells to know when to be, start producing and becoming the fat cells? Chemical signals. Yeah, chemical signals. Remember, with a pluripotent stem cell that can become multiple things, what of those multiple things it becomes is going to be based on the chemical signal. So in this case, I continue to eat cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That chemical signal is going to tell that mesenchymal stem cell, we need more adipocytes. And it's going to make adipocytes to replace those adipocytes uh, to be able to, you know, store that fat. Uh, if on the other hand, I just had surgery and lost a lot of blood, then a different chemical signal tells that mesenchymal cells, we need to make more red blood cells to replace those red blood cells that are lost. So it's gonna be chemical signals that are gonna determine which of those paths those mesenchymal cells take. So absolutely, you guys are correct. You guys all had the right idea. You knew we were, I wasn't gonna work. It wouldn't be, I would still get fat again, right? The issue is that 
the adipocells don't divide, but we still have those mesenchymal stem cells inside your body that would be able to produce new adipocytes. Excellent, perfect. All right, All right. And again, we kind of already hinted at this. As we know, these adipocytes uh, store energy. Obviously, that's one of their primary functions. But as was also mentioned, they also play an important role in helping to provide protection, provide insulation to help to regulate body temperature, cushioning and protecting the organs. We talked about that ptosis of the kidney from the loss of adipose. So it provides protection, it provides a storage of energy, it provides insulation. So again, it does have uh, some important functions as long as it is uh, maintained in moderation. All right. Do, do, do. Perfect. Excellent. Our third type of loose connective tissue is reticular connective tissue. Now, not surprisingly, reticular connective tissue is primarily made of reticular uh, fibers. And notice here, you can see those elaborately branching fibers that we talked about. All right, remember, these are still made of collagen, the protein collagen. But here, the collagen is arranged in these elaborately branching uh, cells. And in fact, that gives a lot of space for things like white blood cells and other cells to be in here, the fibroblasts and fibrocytes and all those things. This always reminds me, for those of you who are familiar with it, of like a cherry blossom tree. If you've ever been back east, uh, cherry blossom trees like in Washington and other areas have these elaborately branching uh, branches, short elaborate branches with these beautiful little white and pink uh, flowers on them. And that's kind of what this always reminds me of. So again, remember, it's still the collagen protein, but these fibers are arranged very, very differently. Produ blah, 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 blah. Produces a very loose and supportive tissue to house things like white blood cells, to provide protection. And like I said, we find this in places like bone marrow, the liver, the spleen, and our lymph nodes. All right, questions on that? Excellent. What that leaves us then with is our last connective tissue, and that is blood. Uh, blood, which we'll talk about in great depth when we get to 431. In fact, if you have me for 431, we will start with the cardiovascular system, starting with the heart, starting with the blood vessels, starting with the blood, so we'll get it right away. But there is some basic information we need to know about it. It is indeed a unique connective tissue. And as we already hinted at, what's uh, unique about it, it is the only fluid tissue. It is contained within the blood vessels. So it is also sometimes referred to as the vesicular tissue. Either of those are appropriate names for it. And again, being fluid, uh, it's hard to think of it in terms of a connective tissue. Remember, a connective tissue basically has two components. It has cells and it has matrix, that inorganic matrix. So does blood meet those criteria? Does blood have cells and, sorry, I apologize. My, uh, does blood have cells? Yes. Sure, give me an example. Identify white blood cells, red blood cells. White blood cells. I heard red blood cells. Anything else? Mm. Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? The obvious answer is yes, there's something else. What is that something else? Monocytes. Monocytes are actually a type of white blood cell, and, I'm not, and neutrophils are another example of that. Ah, that's the one I was looking for, platelets. You guys are right, neutrophils, monocytes, those are specific types of white blood cells. For this exam, I will not be holding you responsible for individual types of, red, of white blood cells. When we get to 431, you'll get to worry about this. So for right now, it's just these three, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. However, we do have a little bit of an issue. Let's look up here at our light microscopy. <clears throat> This cell right here, what is this cell right here? White blood cell? 
Now, this one's actually the red blood cell. Notice they're the most numerous of them. And as you look at all of these red blood cells, what do you notice about these red blood cells? What's different about them from every other cell you've seen? No nucleus. No nucleus, absolutely. When we think of uh, the definition of a true cell, right? True cell has a nucleus, has all these organelles and all those types of stuff. Does our red blood cell really meet that criteria? No. No, it's basically just a big bag of hemoglobin. At one time, it was... At one time, it was a true cell, but it's not a true cell anymore. It's really not a true cell anymore by the time it's a red blood cell. Now, let's look at our white blood cells. Do they have nuclei? Can they divide? Can they make proteins? Do they have organelles? Yeah, absolutely. White blood cells meet the criteria. Any idea what this right here is? It kind of looks like someone got a little piece of dirt on the slide right there. Right? They didn't clean the slide well before they put it on there, or a little piece of chewing gum that's been stuck on there. Right? Is, well, is that turns the out that's actually the platelet. Platelets are actually pieces of cell. Basically what happens is we have this big massive cell which has all these appendages on it, and these appendages rip off. And that little ripped off cell piece actually becomes a platelet. So a platelet comes off of a cell. It's an arm of a leg of a cell but it's not an actual cell. So notice, when we're talking about cells, really, two of the three things that we called cells are not true cells. Red blood cells used to be true cells, platelets came off of true cells, but when they're floating around in the blood, they're not really true cells anymore. Question. Because of that, we cheat. Rather than using the term cells when talking about the components of the blood, we instead use the term formed element. Now, white blood cells are still cells, so it still counts. And these red blood cells and platelets either used to be or came from cells. So to make things a little easier, when talking about blood, the white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets we refer to as formed elements instead of true cells. We don't use the term true cells, we just use the term formed elements, and that kind of gets us around it. All right, so far so good? All right, we have one other issue. This is an anatomy and physiology class. Are we gonna get away with terms like white blood cell, red blood cell, and platelets? No, but I wish. No. Yes, yeah, I that's us. I wish as well. So instead, we have to use the appropriate anatomical terms for that. So what is the appropriate anatomical term? Let's start easy. The appropriate anatomical term for a red blood cell is what? Hemoglobin? No, hemoglobin is the protein that it contains. Uh, there it is. I see it at the bottom. Erythrocyte. So it is a erythrocyte is the appropriate anatomical term for a red blood cell. Now, like we said, there are five different types of white blood cells, eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, all of those. But there is a generic term for white blood cells. What are the generic terms for white blood cells? All white blood cells. There we go, leukocytes. And what is the appropriate anatomical term for a platelet? It's a little trickier. Of course, if you had your connective tissue handout in front of you for later, you might be able to cheat and take a peek at that and figure out what it is. I'll wait. There we go. Thrombocyte. Perfect. Excellent. So from now on, you will use the appropriate anatomical terms for identifying those on the exam. All right. Now, as we mentioned, it also has to have not just formed elements, but also it has to have a matrix. And that matrix is, of course, the blood plasma. And that blood plasma is mostly water. And all the stuff dissolved in the water. And the plasma is what is used to transport almost everything 
in the blood. In fact, pretty much everything but one thing is transported within the plasma of the blood. What's the one thing that is not transported in the blood? I know you guys know this. You just not think of it in these terms. Remind me again what these red blood cells do? Transport oxygen. There you go. They have that hemoglobin that transports oxygen. Oxygen is the only thing that isn't transported in the plasma. It's 97.5%, 98% of oxygen is transported in the hemoglobin of the red blood cells, but pretty much everything else that is transported by the blood is transported in the plasma. So absolutely, it has a matrix, it has cells, what we're gonna call formed elements. And so those, it is indeed a connective mm -hmm. tissue. All right. So again, your book's got a nice table that talks about all of these connective tissues, their characteristics, where you find them in the body. Make sure you are comfortable with that. All right, questions on that? All right, let's go from here then. Go ahead and clear all my drawings. Uh, one quick question. Yeah. Uh, the platelets uh, are, you said those are uh, just pieces of a cell. What kind of cell? Is it just the red cell or the white blood cell or? Uh, the name of the cell, they're actually called megakaryocytes. And again, you don't need to know that for this test, but when you get to 431, we'll learn that. But yes, the short answer to your question is that they come off of a very special type of cell called a megakaryocyte. Okay. But you don't have to know that for this test. Just recognize the thrombocytes, right? Let's get out of the habit of using terms like platelets and white blood cells and red blood cells. All righty. We are done with our connective tissues now, and what we need to do is talk about our membranes. However, I think to help to really solidify this information, it would be a better use of our time to switch gears into lab mode real quickly for a brief few minutes. Uh, and in this case, talk about our connective tissue histology that you are gonna be responsible for. If you've looked at this list, which I'm hoping you have, um, you'll see that there's not as much to it because these things are pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Uh, so it's pretty, yeah, hopefully useful that way. Um, oops, no, wrong button. I need that back, thank you. And then I also need that back. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, so let's go ahead and quickly through, go through these. There isn't much. And like I said, the advantage of them is that they are very uh, distinctly different from each other as you look at them. So let's, like we did last time, quickly go through these things. Uh, identify the specific type of tissue. Elastic. Not a bad guess. However, remember elastic, the fibers are going to be more parallel. Notice these are all kind of uh, all over the place in the way they appear. Oh, 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 cobweb? Yep, it's cobwebby. So what type of tissue would that be? Areolar. Areolar connective tissue. Remember, we want to say epithelial tissue or connective tissue when it is appropriate. Perfect. Excellent. So there are a couple ways you should have been able to figure this out. The first, as was pointed out, dead on, it has that cobwebby appearance. Everything's kind of all over the place. But remember, with the dense irregular, it's fibrous tightly packed together, whereas this has a lot of space in between it. And again, notice I say space in between it, but remember this space is where the ground substance is and where you found the cells. So it's not actually space. It's filled with ground substance and cells, but it has that cobwebby appearance. So definitely the appearance of it is a way you should be able to recognize it. And also, because like last time, since we're going in order, the real air connective tissue is the first one on the list. So that's the other way you should have been able to figure it out. Notice uh, again, the fibers that we're seeing at this low magnification are the bigger, more coarse collagen fibers. And uh, where's my, there we go. So we see these collagen fibers that these are all collagen fibers that we're mostly seeing. Although notice this dark one right here is an example of an elastic fiber. However, notice if we increase the magnification, the elastic fibers are more distinct whereas the collagen fibers kind of almost become kind of uh, out of focus when we get uh, at a higher magnification. 
Notice also, as we look at the cells, all we see are these mostly pinprick looking cells. And again, usually what we're seeing is just the nucleus. Right? And notice here, nucleus, 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 small nuclei. And like I said, we're not going to have to worry about telling those apart from each other. Is it possible? Yes. Do I expect you to be able to do it? No. However, look at this cell right here or this cell right here. Notice for these, we see the nucleus, but you see the whole cell as well. Right, this one here, you're just seeing the nucleus. This one here, you're just seeing the nucleus. This one here, you're just seeing the nucleus. These two cells are very, very different. The reason they're very, very different is as you can see, and I will use a different color for this, we can see all of the cytoplasm because they're filled with this dark kind of a grainy looking material on the inside. And now that I've totally surrounded them, I'm gonna clear it so we can get a better view. Notice it's not uniform, it's very grainy. And the reason for this is because it is packed filled with massive numbers of vesicles, or what are also known as granules. And inside, they contain a very important chemical. Any idea what chemical this might be that they contain inside of them? Histamine, there you go, perfect, excellent. Again, even if you don't know the answers, you should have your connective tissue handout in front of you and you should be able to figure it out by looking at that. Absolutely, the chemical it has inside of it is histamine. What is histamine used for? Oops, I spelled it wrong. What is histamine used for? Come on, I know you guys know this one. There, perfect. It's used for our inflammatory response. Remember we talked about slamming your hand in that car door and you get that swelling as a result of that? That is an inflammatory response, right? Inflammation has four key factors to it, right? Redness, warmth, swelling, and pain. Because what histamine does is it does two things. It causes our blood vessels to dilate, as it dilates, more blood comes to the area, making the area red in color, making the area warm because that blood brings heat with it. The other thing it does is it makes the capillaries leaky. So more fluid comes out of the capillaries. That causes the swelling. And as that swelling pushes on the nerves, it causes pain, right? That swelling, that redness, that pain that tells you you've been injured. If you are outside skipping in your backyard and you roll your ankle and it gets as big like a, like a grapefruit, you're probably not gonna go run a 5K the next day as a result of that because that swelling has told you you are injured. <clears throat> However, right, the problem with histamine is sometimes it, these cells can be activated inappropriately. Like when your neighbor's cutting the grass, that, uh, that uh, grass pollen can irritate and stimulate histamine release in your mucous membrane. And when the blood vessels in your mucous membrane dilate and bring more fluid, it produces more mucus and you get a runny nose and you get congestion. So what do you take to help combat that? You take an antihistamine, right? Or as I've mentioned, I have two daughters. One of my daughters has an extreme peanut and tree nut allergy. Right? What happens is the proteins of a peanut can cause an adverse reaction in her body that makes her body think it is under attack. And she can get an inappropriate histamine reaction that can cause massive dilations of most of the blood vessels of her body. And she has a massive drop in blood pressure. It can cause a massive increase in mucus production of the airways, causing the airways to be constricted. What do we call that condition where suddenly she can't breathe and her blood pressure drops and she can't get blood to her brain anymore? What do we call that? Anaphylaxis shock. Anaphylactic shock, absolutely, anaphylaxis, absolutely. So what do we carry with us everywhere we go? Epinephrine. 
an epinephrine pen, absolutely. So we can jab her in the leg and that will increase her blood pressure and it'll dilate the smooth muscle of her airways and try to help to allow her to survive that, right? And then she starts popping the Benadryls to try to stop that inflammatory reaction. All right, so again, this histamine is a vitally important chemical, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, it gets inappropriately used in the body. Now, because these cells are chock filled with this histamine, it makes it easy to see not just the nucleus, but the entire cell. So these particular cells that are chock filled with histamine inside of our areolar connective tissue are easy to identify. And so these will be the one type of cell you will be responsible for identifying in an areolar connective tissue. And of course, what type of cells are these? Come on, if you guys haven't grabbed your connective tissue handouts to be looking at while you're doing this yet, you're never gonna get it. Mast cells. Mast cells, there you go, excellent. These are the mast cells. So this is the one cell type you will be responsible for in our areolar connective tissue. And that's because these histamine granules in them make them very, very obvious. All right, questions on that? Type of tissue is this? Adipose. Adipose, excellent. This is indeed our adipose tissue. Hold on, I gotta juggle a couple things around here. Uh, again, it has that nice uh, chicken wire type of appearance to it. Again, makes it very distinct. The nuclei are always shoved to the side. It is almost always clear. There are a few stains that will bind to the lipids in this. Uh, and again, when they can be specifically shown, but again, these clear lipid filled cells, as you'll see, are found everywhere. As we continue to look through the body, you're gonna find the occasional adipocyte all over the place. So everywhere, they're all over the body. But stuck together like this, we find them in this adipose tissue. And again, it's very easy, very distinct. As you can see, there's not a whole lot you need to be able to identify. You need to identify that fat vacuole, that oil droplet that's at the center. And what's one of the locations where you would find this, uh, a large amount of this adipose tissue? Your stomach. Okay, yeah, uh, true, yeah, stomach or breasts or, or butt or places like that. Yeah, that's true. But really, if you think about it, that's under the skin. So really subcutaneously is more what I was looking for. But remember, we also talked about you have large amounts of it around the kidney. Uh, there's large amounts of it around the digestive system. So there are a lot of other places in the body you'll find it as well. Is, is there a capsule around the liver to protect the liver? Uh, no, the liver doesn't have a fat capsule around it the same way that the kidneys do. And I think my, some of that might be size. The kidneys a little, I mean, the, the liver is more tucked up under the ribs, whereas mm. the kidneys are a little below it, so in a little bit more exposed space. Yeah. All righty. Another very obvious tissue. What tissue is this? Reticular connective tissue. Particular again, as we talked about, it has those great cherry blossom uh, looking uh, branches to them. Identify the linear structure that I'm pointing at right here. Reticular fibers. Reticular fiber. What protein is this linear structure comprised of again? What, what type of protein forms? Collagen, there you go, perfect, right? Remember, these are collagen fibers just like, made of collagen, just like collagen fibers are, but the collagen is arranged very, very differently. And of course, as we said, identify one of the locations where you would find this tissue. Again, remember where you find these things are definitely questions that are going to be on the exam. What's one liver would be one place? Excellent. Give me at least one more and I'll give you the rest. Spleen, excellent. Lymph nodes, perfect. Uh, liver, spleen, lymph nodes, bone marrow. Right? Those are the main places where you're going to find this tissue. <clears throat> excellent. Now, this tissue down here. Notice as we look at it, this one has very small spot-like nuclei to it and fibers that are not parallel going in different directions from each other. So what type of tissue is this tissue down here? Dense connective tissue. 
True, but we want you are right. This is a dense connective tissue, but we want to be more specific. Which irregular? Dense irregular. Absolutely. This is a dense irregular connective tissue. Absolutely. Now remember, notice we said different stains will show different things. As we talked about, this one clearly shows the nuclei. Again, notice you can clearly see the difference between the epithelial tissue and the connective tissue. Right? Epithelial tissues are very, very cell dense. Connective tissues are very, very cell, cell sparse. So that's why it's so easy to find that basal surface of the epithelial tissue. And this one kind of shows the fibers. But remember, as we talked about, this is a stain that shows the, uh, the, the this particular one shows the collagen fibers and all the different orientations. But notice also, this one also shows the nuclei. So again, we see those dark specks of the nuclei. And again, the dermis of our skin, deep in our skin, is one of the places where we'll find this dense irregular connective tissue. Notice the difference between this and this. All right? This is the picture from your textbook. Again, notice there's a little bit of waviness because it wasn't stretched out onto the slide before it was put on there. But even with that waviness, you can see all the fibers are pretty much going the same direction and those elongated nuclei. What's nice about this one is this one, you can really see those fine fibers that are making it up. Notice this one, you can still make out the fibers. They're just not quite as distinct, but notice what you can make out on this one. What you can make out on this one is these nice big elongated nuclei. And those elongated nuclei are the dead giveaway that we're looking at what type of tissue here, Dense regular connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue. Perfect. And remind me again, what's one of the locations where we would find this? A ligament. Uh, A ligament. Absolute ligament. Where else? Tendons. Tendon. And remind me again, what's the difference between a ligament and a tendon? Ligaments Lig connect. Ligaments connect bone. Bone, to bone and tendons connect muscles to bone. Perfect. Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. Perfect. Excellent. 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 Now, look at this one and look at this one. At first, they may seem similar, especially if we go from this one to that one. The first thing that stands out is you see mostly parallel fibers. And so when you see those mostly parallel fibers, your first instinct may be to jump to, ah, another dense, irreg I mean, a dense regular connective tissue. But notice, as I mentioned, how much more coarse these fibers are. And remember, nuclei are going to be a dead giveaway. Are these nuclei all elongated and parallel in the same way? No. No. So while this may look like a dense regular connective tissue, what am I actually looking at here? Elastic. elastic ligament. And what did I say the third key that could sometimes help you identify elastic connective tissues was? Color. Fibers. Color, right? Remember, sometimes we said the fibers may be more yellowish in color. Notice this particular stain doesn't really show the fibroblasts, so we don't see the nuclei of the cells, but this yellowish coloration to the fibers is a dead giveaway you are looking at an elastic connective tissue. So again, if we just looked at the fibers, parallel fibers, we might think, ah, oh, this is a dense regular. Because again, these are the only two that are similar to each other. But the nuclei and the potential of the color are the main ways we're going to tell them apart. And where would you find this tissue? Anyone remember where we said we'd find these? Well, one of the main locations we find them is in elastic ligaments of our, uh, that help to support our vertebral column. There's one other place where we might find a lot of elastic uh, connective tissue. Anybody have a guess? Maybe something that needs to be able to stretch and expand and dilate? The neck, the muscle. Skin's a good, yep, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a fair amount of it in the skin. Remember, we talked about the elasticity of the skin. The other place what we find a lot of them is not necessarily the pelvic bone, but the, remember, well, that's the, the fibrocartilage we'll talk about. Blood vessels, especially our arteries. Our arteries, because again, remember, the heart is not like a faucet. 
where you turn it on and it's continuous flow of blood. It pumps blood and then it stops pumping blood and then it pumps blood and it stops pumping blood. So what your arteries need to be able to do is when the heart is pumping, that artery needs to be able to stretch to accommodate all that blood and then to recoil after it stops pumping and stretch and recoil and stretch and recoil. So our arteries in particular, our blood vessels, but definitely our arteries in particular, all our blood vessels, but our arteries in particular, have a fair amount of elastic connective tissue in it as well. All right, excellent. Cool, what is this? Identify the- Island cartilage? Island cartilage. Uh, identify, so you guys all see my pointer, right? Little red dot? Yes? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. Identify the space. Matrix? Lacuna. Lacuna, excellent. Identify the cell. Chondrocyte. Perfect. Notice again, with that, I didn't move the pointer at all. So that key word is going to tell you what I want, right? Bears live in, cage, in caves. Uh, chondrocytes live in lacunas. We have spaces where the cell lives. Right, this out here is our matrix. And as you guys clearly identified, this matrix is uniform and clear, and that makes it highland cartilage. Excellent. What's one location where we would find this? Maybe bone? Yeah, at the end of the bones where we form joints. At the end of the bones where we form joints, right? Helping hold the ribs together. And remember the bridge of the nose. These are places where we would find our highland cartilage, right? Again, notice it's not just the color of the matrix, it's that uniformity of it. Different stains are gonna make it appear differently, but we're always gonna see that space lacuna, we're always gonna see that chondrocyte, and the matrix is gonna be fairly uniform, right? We're not seeing a bunch of fibers at all sorts of different orientations. Quick question. You said yes. it's going to be end, ends of bones where we start to form joints, and then you said the tip of the nose because or the no, bri bridge, the bridge of the nose, Remember, gotcha. the bridge of the nose, not the tip. This is rubbery. This is fibrous connective tissues, dense, irregular, and stuff like that, and obviously skin, mm -hmm. right? But the hyaline cartilage is up here, the bridge of the nose, the rigid part, not all the way up the top. The top is bone, but okay. what we think of is that bridge of the nose, that part right there, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Where is the pericardium? Ah, well, first of all, pericardium is around the heart. So you're close. You're not quite reading it right. What is, what is the word we're looking for there? Mm. Perichondrium. Right? So remember, one of the things here, here we have, again, our hyaline cartilage. Anyone know what this over here is? Muscle. Yeah, skeletal muscle. We can actually see the stripes of the skeletal muscle that are over here. Excellent. Remember, one of the things we said about cartilage is cartilage is avascular. It doesn't have a direct blood supply, but it still needs oxygen. It still needs nutrients. It's still a living tissue. So what our cartilage needs, and I'm gonna use my highlighter here to emphasize this. We'll use blue. No, I don't wanna use blue, let's use brown. It needs a tissue that surrounds it. And this tissue that surrounds it is going to house the immature cells that we can grow more. Uh, it has the, um, oh, uh, it has an immature cell that uh, helps it to grow. It's gonna house the blood supply that is gonna provide the oxygen and nutrients via diffusion, and it will attach it to the tissues that surround it. So it's gonna protect it, and it's gonna support it, and it's gonna attach it to the tissues around it. Because this tissue wraps around the cartilage, we give it a name based on its location. That's a term we've used before. And what are we going to call this tissue based on its location? Because it's around the cartilage. Yeah. You guys just asked me the question. What is it? Perichondrium. Perichondrium. Excellent. It is a perichondrium because it wraps around the cartilage. Peri, perimeter, around the outside of. Um, so we're gonna call it the perichondrium. Excellent, right? However, 
It is a specific tissue type. So what tissue type forms the perichondrium? Dense, irregular, connective tissue. Exactly. And I'm just going to abbreviate that because it's more convenient for me. Excellent. Absolutely. It is a dense, irregular connective tissue. Oops. I didn't mean to erase all of that. Um, and that's purple now for some odd reason. Okay, excellent. Well, it's, you get the point. So on the exam, if I erase that, and if I erase that, I could have an arrow pointing to this on the exam, and I could ask you one of two questions. Identify the tissue type, and your answer would be? Dense irregular connective tissue. Excellent. Or I could uh, point at that and say, identify this tissue based on its location, and your answer would be? Perfect. Excellent. All righty. Now, compare this cartilage and this matrix to this cartilage and this matrix. Notice we still have lacunas. We still have chondrocytes. But when we look at the matrix here, is it smooth and uniform where we don't really see any fibers? No. No, we see plenty of fibers in this one. This one's chock filled with fibers. I love this picture. This picture makes me want to get a black light and a bong and a Dave Matthews CD and just stare at it for hours, right? But in this case, this is so chock filled with fibers. What kind of fibers are these? Elastic. elastic. These are the elastic fibers. Absolutely. Remember, they're dark, they're distinct, they're going all sorts of different directions. In this, these massive, massive, massive amounts of elastic fibers is what makes this cartilage much more bendy, much more flexible. All right. And where were the two locations that we said we would find this elastic cartilage? In our ear. Yep, that rubbery ear, and what was the other one? Nose? No. No, no not nose. Epiglottis. Oh. Remember the epiglottis for help us to swallow. Uh, during the next break, I will get us a sagittal section of the head, and I'll actually show you where the epiglottis is so that mm -hmm. you guys can see that. Okay? Would we, um, say that the arteries would also have this, since we said that it requires a lot of no, remember, arteries have elastic connective tissue. This is elastic cartilage. Remember, both have a lot of elasticity to them, but they are not the same tissue. So elastic cartilage and elastic connective tissue are not the same thing. Both have a lot of elastic fibers, which allow them to be flexible, but very different tissues found in very different locations. All right, thanks. No, excellent. And it's a great question. A lot of people get confused by that. But no, elastic connective tissue and elastic cartilage are two different things. Okay? Okay. Excellent. Now, notice this one also has lacunas, has chondrocytes. But notice here we can actually see the fibers. They actually have a more uh, waviness, more linear, more parallel to their orientation. So notice the matrix isn't smooth and clear, but it also isn't chaotic with these dark distinct fibers, right? Here's, whoops, another one up close. Notice again, well, this one's a lower magnification, but you can still see the general trends of these fibers. And the reason I use this one is notice this one, even though we can't see the fibers quite as clearly, this one is so chalk filled with collagen fibers. What often happens is that notice the lacunas, which normally are spread randomly throughout the cell, they get it kind of lined up in rows. This has so much collagen fibers that rather than just randomly distributing the lacunas, they start to get lined up in rows because these collagen fibers uh, end up basically lining up so much, we're relatively parallel, that they kind of force the lacunas to kind of line up in rows. And what type of tissue is this? Fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage, excellent. And where were some of the locations we said you'd find the fibrocartilage? There were three big places where we said you could find it. Remember, this is the one that gives us that shock absorber. All of these collagen fibers make this an important shock absorber. So all right? the all the like the bones where well, you no, no. Most bones come together, remember, with hyaline cartilage, but 
the knee, remember the knee has that high impact. So that's where we have that meniscus in the knee, right? And again, I'll write that out. That meniscus in the knee is one of the locations, right? Helping to provide that extra padding in the knee, right? Where else? What about the spine? Yeah, the intervertebral discs of our spine are made up of fibrocartilage and the one that's responsible for the waddle. What was that one again? The pubic symphysis. Remember the pubic symphysis is that joint in the front of the pelvis. I'll grab that picture too. Let me make a note of that real quickly so I can grab those during the, because normally we'd have the posters up in the wall and I'd point these out. So let me get the sagittal's head and uh, the um, pelvic symphysis. I'll grab those two pictures so we can take a look at those things so you know what I'm talking about when we get there. I'll do that during the next break. All right. Excuse me, Professor? Yes. Um, so w if you ask the question like where would this be located, can we just say knee or do you want us to say meniscus? I would prefer you say meniscus. If you say knee, uh, and again, on this first exam, uh, for this first exam, I'd probably give you an okay for that. I would probably give you full credit, uh, but I, I would really prefer that you be more specific. It's always best to be more specific in your answers. So when, especially when I say, you know, a specific location, it's always best to be as specific as possible. In, in all honesty, on this first test in the summer, I would probably accept me, uh, but uh, meniscus would be better. A question. Um, could you elaborate? You said that. What's the clear, um, or is there any a dead giveaway between the elastic cartilage and the fibro cartilage? The arrangement of the fibers. The, the fibers. Yeah, notice these fibers are more parallel and, and, and um, less distinct, whereas these fibers are very dark, very distinct, and very chaotic in their arrangement. They're okay. going all over the place, right? All sorts of different orientations. Whereas notice on this one, all the fibers are pretty much going right, left to right. All right, cool. Okay, Thanks. excellent. Here is our bone. Like I said, you're gonna learn everything you ever wanted to know and more about bone connective tissue when we get to it next section. But as we know, let's get the key concepts you need to be able to identify right now. Uh, what is this organizing structure of the compact bone? Osteon. Osteon. What is this space in the center? Central canal. Central canal. Uh, some of the textbooks use older terminology like haversion canal. Any idea why it's called the haversion canal? Good old Bob Haversion was the very first person who identified it. So he's the one who planted his flag on it, right? Do we care about that? No, central canal makes more sense. What is this space over here? It's a lacuna. And the cell you would find in this space? Osteocyte. Yeah, again, notice even at this high magnification, you really don't see the cells. There may be some slides where we're able to see the cells, but usually in the osteocytes, we're not seeing the cells. We just know that they have to be living in these spaces. And if there's a space, there has to be a cell living in it. So we can see those spaces. And then of course we have the layers of the matrix that we see here as well. And last, but definitely not least, tissue type. Blood. Blood, formed element. What's your point? Um, erythrocyte. 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 Formed element. Leukocyte. Leukocyte. And that tiny little formed element right there. Obviocyte. Thrombocyte. Remember, the platelets are thrombocytes. So those are thrombocytes. These two little dots right there are the thrombocytes. Here's one by itself. There's a bigger one right there. So those are the thrombocytes. Erythrocytes, the red blood cells, are the most common. And we even have four white blood cells or leukocytes on this as well. And again, these are different types. You don't have to worry about distinguishing that for this exam. All right. Can I ask you a question about the bone tissue picture? Um, we said that anytime we see a lacuna, the space will have a cell. And that's also a space that will have water and salt. And that's why it swells up. That kind of thing goes here. Or was it only for 
no, that's the, the a real our connective tissue. Those are those spaces. No, this is these are every every bear lives in a cave, and every cave has a bear, right? Our bone has a solid matrix, right? It's not that different from the cartilage. Notice every single lacuna has a chondrocyte in it. You're not just going to have a random hollow space inside of the tissue with nothing inside of it. If you're going to have a space inside that solid tissue, it's because there's a cell living there. With the chondrocytes in our cartilage, we clearly see the cells. Here, we don't clearly see the cells, but we know if there is a space there, that space has to be for a cell. And so even though we don't see it on the exam, I have no problem pointing my pointer there and say, identify the cell found in here in this location or identify this cell. And you know that that has to be an osteocyte. Okay. Thank okay. You. Excellent. We are doing good. Perfect. All right. That is good on that. That is it for our histology for that. So here's where things get fun. Now that we know epithelial tissues, now that we know connective tissues, we need to put these things together to make our membranes. So end that and close that and come back here. Excellent. So we understand epithelial tissues, we understand connective tissues. We need to put these together to make a membrane. So let's do this first. All right, so our body is lined with membranes. And all membranes are comprised of basically two things. An epithelial tissue, which of course, where's my annotation, there it is. Our epithelial tissues are gonna be superficial, right? These are the ones that are on top. And the connective tissue, which is going to be deep, right? These are the ones that are on the bottom. So all tip membranes are made up of these two things, an epithelial tissue on top of a connective tissue. And there are four main types of membranes that cover the surfaces of our body, right? After all, if they're epithelial tissues, they line a surface. And when I mean surfaces of the body, I mean both inside and outside surfaces. What are the four different types of membranes that we find in the body? Give me one of them. Well, there's one type of membrane you've already learned about in this class, like wrapping around the stomach and all of those. Oh, well, that's not it, but that's a good one. Excellent. Mucous membranes are definitely one of them. Guess what Sorry? mucous? Yep. Hold on. Guess what mucous? You're absolutely correct, but let's answer this question first. Guess what mucous membranes do? Create mucus. There you go. Not a, not a tricky question. They make mucus. Excellent. As someone just mentioned, we also have talked about serous membranes. Oh, and speaking of fun with vocabulary, mucous membranes, in the case mucus is the adjective that describes the membrane. If we wanted to use the noun, it would be mucosa. So mucosa would be acceptable for that. That is the noun version of that. Same thing with serous membranes. Serious is the adjective describing the noun membrane, or we could say serosa. And guess what serous membranes do? You guys already know this. They make serous fluid. There you go, they make serous fluid. Excellent, perfect. What's another membrane type? What membrane is this? Come on, your skin, what membrane is that? Really? Cutaneous? Cutaneous membrane, which is your skin. Your skin is your cutaneous membrane. Your cutaneous membrane is your skin. And the last is synovial membrane. Synovial membranes are the ones that are, are surround our movable joints. So there are four different types of membrane, mucous membranes, serous membranes, cutaneous membranes, and synovial membranes. 
for all four membranes, we obviously need to know where we'd find them, right? We need to know their functions. But the other important thing we're going to need to know is we're going to need to know uh, the tissue types, right? Both epithelial tissue and connective tissues that form them. And because you have a lot of them all over different places in the body, right? And because anatomists hate you, uh, there are going to be many names for these things based on their locations. And so we're going to need to know any locational names uh, as well and be able to identify those. So not only do we need to, like a perichondrium is a dense irregular connective tissue that wraps around the cartilage, right? That's not the only place we find dense irregular connective tissue, but when we put it around the cartilage, we called it a perichondrium, right? Our serous membranes, a serous membrane that is on the surface of the heart. What do we call that again? Pericardium? Yeah, pericardium. Whereas the, um, the serous membrane that lines my abdominal cavity was the... parietal peritoneum. And again, on the heart, it really should have been visceral pericardium, right? This idea of giving things names based on their location is not a new concept. We've been talking about this for a while now, right? So we talked about, you know, the right visceral pleura. We talked about the parietal perichondrium. We talked about the visceral peritoneum, right? Those are all names based on locations. And again, name based on location is how I will phrase it on the exam. And so there's going to be many names based on locations that you'll need to know. So you need to know both the tissues types and their names based on locations. What we're going into now is some dense material. So this is probably a good place to take our next break. We'll take a quick break here. Uh, that way we can come back fresh and ready uh, for some dense vocabulary, right? Fun with vocabulary. So uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, indeed. Joys indeed. Uh, let's go ahead and take our next break. Uh, my clock says 1041, so let's come back at 1055. And at 1055, we will restart. And then I will uh, start the recording at that time. All right. Any questions before we take our break? All right. I will see you in 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and finish off our tissues by talking about our discussion of membranes. Again, as we mentioned, there are four main types of membranes that line the surfaces of the body, our mucous membranes, our serous membranes, our cutaneous membranes, and our synovial membranes. We need to know where they're located, uh, we need to know what their functions are, and Every single tissue, as you can see here, is comprised of epithelial tissues and connective tissues. So we have to put those tissues together and come up with fun names based on their locations because as we know, anatomists hate us. Excellent, so let's work our way through these. Starting first, oh, and again here, this is a pretty picture from a different textbook. This is the pretty picture from your textbook kind of showing these and talking about the anatomy of this as well. Let's start first by talking about mucous membranes. How would you identify the location of where a mucous membrane is located in your body? My microphone is on, right? You guys can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, excellent. All right, perfect. So the gastrointestinal tract is definitely an example of one of the places you would find it, absolutely. But we want to be more general in this case when we're given a description, right? Well, let's see if we can figure it out, though. Can you give me another location where you'd find a mucous membrane outside of the digestive system? Is there, for instance, another organ system that might have a mucous membrane in it or lining it? Urinary system, respiratory system, excellent. All of those are great examples. In fact, there's one more. Digestive system, urinary system, respiratory system, and what's the other organ system? Endocrine. No, not endocrine. What was the other one? I didn't hear the other one. Cardiovascular. No, not cardiovascular. 
There okay. it is, reproductive, excellent. Digestive system, urinary system, respiratory system, and reproductive system. Notice what those four systems have in common is they all have cavities. So if you think about it, a mucous membrane lines a cavity that is open to the outside world. Right? So all of those systems, the urinary system, the reproductive system, the digestive system, and the whatever the digestive, urinary, reproductive, and respiratory, all of those are systems that are open to the outside world. So mucous membranes line cavities that are open to the outside world. And again, their job, as we talked about before, is to produce mucus. Now, again, remember, we know now that actually what they do is produce mucin, a protein, and that mucin, is then when it hydrates, becomes mucus. And what is the function of that mucus? As a lubricant? Yeah, one of it is to lubricate, right? Grease in the wheels, make it easier for that cheeseburger you have for breakfast to be swallowed down. What else can it do? Get on the top Say again? Get stuff you don't need out. Like yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. It can capture dust and debris. You know, like in your nasal cavity, it's capturing dust and debris and other materials that way. Absolutely, and then it either is drained or swallowed or spit out. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I wouldn't say that mucus moves hormones so much. There, there aren't really too many hormones that we're releasing outside of the body. Remember, these are liner cavities that are open to the outside of the body. Uh, but are there non-hormone chemicals that can help to provide protection, antibacterial things, or enzymes that can help to bring things down? Absolutely. So there's lots of other things that can be in this mucus as well. Perfect. Excellent. So those are all great examples of some of these things. All right. So we've done our location, we've done our function, we've talked about that. Quick question. So, yes. When on the exam, if you're gonna say what's one of the locations, can we just say respiratory or digestive system? Is that acceptable? Well, so, so let's say it this way. Um, if I ask you to define where you would find a mucous membrane and you just say digestive system, then that's not really an accurate answer. That is one location where you find it, but it doesn't define where you find all mucous membranes. So I think a more accurate definition of where you find a mucous membrane would be lining a cavity that is open to the outside world. If I asked you for one specific example, the digestive system is an example, but again, as we've talked about, is it necessarily as specific as you can be? No, so that wouldn't be specific enough. That wouldn't be really one location. That'd be an organ system. So we would have to say mouth or stomach or small intestine or nasal cavity or you know bladder or you know vagina or urethra or anus or any of those types of things that are a specific location. So just saying the organ system is not gonna be specific enough for full credit on that. Okay. Okay. All righty, now. As we know, all membranes are made up of epithelial tissues on top of connective tissues. So what epithelial tissue forms a mucous membrane? Well, being the sophisticated students that you guys are now, one thing you could do is cheat and look at the picture that is immediately underneath what we're writing right now. And when you look at the picture underneath, what tissue type do you see? There you go, excellent. Simple, oops, columnar, excellent. However, think of all the areas that we said where you would find this. While that simple columnar is in most of the digestive system, is it in all of the digestive system? What epithelial tissue did we find in the oral cavity? you're not sure, grab someone in your family and look inside. Is it a simple, you got the squamous right, but is it just gonna be a single layer of cells inside the oral cavity? Is that gonna provide us our protection from that coffee? There you go, so perfect, excellent. 
And since you wrote it out, I will abbreviate it. Non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Excellent. All right. But that's just the digestive system. Remember, we also said respiratory system. What type of epithelial tissue did you have in your nasal cavity? Come on, this is the one that should be rolling off the tongue by now. Ciliated, pseudostratified, um, columnar tissue. Perfect, excellent. Ciliated, pseudostratified, uh, columnar epithelial tissue. Excellent. Hold on a second. Sorry, I got a dirty look from my daughter because I forgot to close the door when I came back into my office. <laughs> I'm being too loud. Excellent. Uh, interrupting her TikTok videos or whatever important thing she's doing this summer. Um, excellent. So that's in the nasal cavity. But if we think of the entire respiratory system, what did we say you would have in the lungs in the ozovelis for the gas exchange? Simple squamous. All right. In our bladder, transitional. Notice with the epithelial tissues, almost any epithelial tissue can be a epithelial tissue of a mucous membrane. Really, the key with a mucous membrane is the epithelial tissue totally depends on the function. If the function is absorption, like in the digestive system, it's simple columnar. In the nose, we're producing and moving mucus. So that's the ciliated pseudostratified columnar. In our mouth, we need that protection. So it's the non-keratinized stratified squamous. So notice with our epithelial tissues of our mucous membranes, they can vary dramatically. It can be any sort of different type of epithelial tissue uh, based on where it is located. All right, so again, there isn't just gonna be one. It is going to vary, and let's cheat and grab this and move this up and out of the way now since we've got the various. Excellent. However, and here's the key with an epithelial, I mean with a mucous membrane. With a mucous membrane, no matter what type of epithelial tissue is on top, there is one and only one type of connective tissue that you will find underneath it. The and what is that? Excellent. It is areolar. There are basically three ways you could have figured this out. A, you could have known the information. B, you could have read it from down here at the bottom of the picture where it says a real art connective tissue. Or, what did I say you should guess when you don't know what the right answer is? Yeah. Aerial art connective tissue, excellent. So it is going to be an aerial art connective tissue no matter what type of epithelial tissue is on top it is always an areolar art connective tissue that it sits on top of. Now, we said, and again, uh, I think I have to fix this now. So hold on, let me cheat and erase this. I'm gonna put TT here for tissue type. The tissue type is areolar connective tissue. However, as we've also mentioned, areolar is the most common tissue found in the body. All right, so it's found in lots of different locations. This particular areolar art connective tissue, an areolar art connective tissue that is part of a mucous membrane, we are gonna give it a name based on its location. And that name based on its location, guess what that is? Again, you can cheat and look at the picture down below. Lamin appropria, excellent. Lamin appropria, right? So an areal art connective tissue that is part of a mucous membrane based on its location, we are gonna call it a lamin appropria. So no matter what epithelial tissue is on top, and notice they've even got us a goblet cell here. This is that dead giveaway. This is a mucous membrane. This one happens to be simple columnar, but it could be many different types of epithelial tissues. But no matter what epithelial tissue is on top, this is always going to be an areolar connective tissue. Uh, and we call it the lamin appropria based on its location. All right, questions on that? 
Yeah, yeah just for every. I'm sorry, go ahead. Say again. Are we going to go ahead and do that with every membrane and every um, area that we have a specific name for the areolar tissue based on where it's at? Well, again, area, so not. Uh, yeah, so yes, in some other places it has names based on its own locations, and in other areas it doesn't. In this case, an areolar connective tissue that is part of a mucous membrane is called a lamina propria based on its location. But no, not everywhere areolar connective tissue is, is it going to have a specific name. We're actually going to see that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a secret. We're going to see that on the very next tissue. Okay. Okay. But every tissue will have stuff that it has named based on their locations. All right. Uh, was there another question on this as well? Uh, just, just, uh, I just want to double check I understand correctly. You said for the, it's going to be 100% of the time we're going to have um, the areolar tissue or the lamina that's going to be under the epithelium, correct? Correct. Okay. No matter what epithelial tissue is on top, this tissue right here. The, the connective tissue of a mucous membrane is always going to be a real art connective tissue. And this tissue, based on its location, is always going to be called a lamina propria. So the real art connective tissue that's part of a mucous membrane is always a lamina propria. All right. Now I have one more issue. Notice as we've been going through this, mucus has been written two different ways US and OUS. Which one is correct? Now I know, again, being the sophisticated students you are, you can tell that they're one letter apart, so you could write it either way and get it right on the exam. But which is the actual correct spelling? O-U-S. Okay, I heard one for O-U-S. Anyone think U-S is the correct spelling? I think aren't U-S. They both, aren't they both correct depending on what the situation you're using it in? Exactly, actually both are correct. U-S is actually the noun. Right, so if you had a cup of mucus in front of you, then that would be U.S., that is the noun. If, however, being the older sibling that you are, you wanted to tease your younger sibling by saying that she was mucusy in appearance, you would be talking about O-U-S, that is the adjective. So there you go, O-U-S, like the mucus membrane when we're describing the membrane, is O-U-S, when we are talking about the substance that is being produced, we talk about U.S. So again, fun with vocabulary. One is the noun, one is the adjective, both are correct. All righty. Let's talk about something we're a teeny bit more familiar with, and that is our serous membranes, or again, the noun is serosa. Excellent. Now, Based on the last definition of where a mucous membrane is located, how would you define where we find serous membranes? The heart. Okay, so again, around the heart, but is around the heart the only place we find it? Where else did we find it? Well, remember, Cirrhosis come in three flavors based on their locations. We have the pericardium around the heart. What else did we have? Pleuris around the lungs. Excellent. And was there one other location? Visceral? No. Peritoneum around the abdominal pelvic cavity. So notice around the heart, around the lungs, around the organs of your abdominal pelvic cavity, right? Those are, notice, all cavities as well. So notice, serous membranes line cavities, just like mucous membranes line cavities. But what's different about the cavities that serous membranes line? Are they open to the outside world? No. No. If, you're, if your thoracic or abdominal pelvic cavity is open to the outside world, please see a doctor immediately. All right? Serous membranes line cavities that are closed to the outside world. Remember also when we were talking about locations, remember these are all double membranes. And with those double membranes, uh, we have the visceral, which are on the organs. And we also have parietal uh, that line the cavities. All right, 
So those are our locations for our serous membranes. They line cavities that are closed to the outside world. What did we say the function of our serous membranes was again? Protect. Isn't it the lubrication again? Yeah, how does it lubricate? How does it protect? Both of those are correct. It provides some protection, mostly from friction by providing lubrication. But what does it produce that makes that lubrication? Serious fluid? Yeah, there you go. Again, mucous membranes make mucus. Serious fluids make serious fluid. Now, I think the heart is a great example, but in lots of other places, that perichondri uh, per pardon me, that pericardiac, uh, perichondrium that f surrounds the heart, is its job to completely fill the space around the heart with as much serious fluid as it possibly can? No, very thin layer. Yeah, exactly. So really, what we want to make is a very thin layer of serous fluid. All right? And that very thin layer just covers the surface, makes that surface slippery, so that it is going to uh, reduce friction, right? And that uh, provides some protection. Now, as we talked about, saliva has serous fluid in it. There are other things that have serous fluid in it. So serous fluid can be found lots of places. The very thin layer of serous fluid that covers the surfaces of a serous membrane, we give a name based on its location. We give a name to that thin layer of serous fluid on top of a serous membrane and by cheating and looking at the picture, guess what we call that thin layer of serous fluid on top of a serous membrane? Transudate. Transudate, excellent. We call it transudate. Transudate is the name based on location for that thin layer of serous fluid on top of a serous membrane whose job is to reduce friction so that our heart can beat in a reduced friction environment. Our lungs can expand and contract. Our stomach and small intestines can churn and rub without getting hot and increasing that uh, friction in there. All right. Now notice these are open, pardon me, these are closed to the outside world. Oh, so there, hold on. Uh, oh, oh. Put that up there. Actually, let's cheat. And Short and let's see if that fits. There we go. Perfect. That works. We have that transudate. Perfect. Now, these membranes are closed to the outside world. They are not open to the outside world. So we don't need a massive amount of protection. We just need a surface. We just need a barrier. So when it comes to epithelial tissues, we don't want it to take up a lot of space. So using our rationale, we could think, what is the smallest, simplest type of layer we could have? Or we could totally cheat and look at the pretty picture. And based on that, what epithelial tissue do you think is going to comprise all serous membranes? Mesothelium. Well, that's its name. We're going to give it based on its location. But by looking at it, how many layers of cells do you see? Three. I see one layer cell. I see three cells, but I see one layer of cells. And what is the shape of that one layer of cells? Squamous? Yeah, simple squamous. There you go. Perfect. Excellent. The epithelial tissue that is going to form all of our uh, serious membranes is going to be a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Absolutely. Right, and I'll go ahead and delete that since we were gonna write that. But as was pointed out, this is not the only place we find the simple squamous. Remember, we found the simple squamous when we looked at it histologically inside the kidney, right? Forming that Bowman's capsule. So again, we're gonna give it a name based on its location. A simple squamous epithelial tissue that is part of a serious membrane, we cause, call a mesothelium based on its location. 
a uh, quick and, question. Yeah. When you when you keep saying based on its location, mm -hmm. if it's in a different part of the body, is not called mesothelium anymore, or exactly. Okay. All right. Let's look at a great example of this. Serous membrane. What connective tissue forms the connective tissue of a serous membrane? Areolar. Areolar, excellent. You could have figured that out one of three ways. You could have known the information, you could have read it off of the picture, or what did I tell you to guess when you don't know what else it is? Guess areolar connective tissue. This tissue down here is an areolar connective tissue. It is the bottom part of a serous membrane. It was also the bottom part of a mucous membrane. Does that mean that this down here is this a lamina propria? Is this a real connective tissue that is part of a serous membrane? Do you think it's a lamina propria? Yes. No. no. Nope. It's not. Remember, we said an areolar connective tissue when it is part of a mucous membrane, it is a lamina propria. This is an areolar connective tissue. Again, I, I, I appreciate this is confusing, but one of the important things to remember is to think of it this way. If I cut a chunk of this areolar connective tissue out and I cut a chunk of areolar connective tissue from a mucous membrane and I look at those two pieces of mucus of a real are connective tissues under the microscope, they look identical, all right? This is my cell phone, all right? It's an Apple. It probably looks very similar to your phone. The difference is this is the one that sits in my pocket. So based on its location, it is my cell phone, all right? So we, we give it a name based on its location. This is my list of connective tissue handouts, right? This looks identical to your connective tissue handout but this one is at my house, so we give it a name based on my, uh, its location. It is Dr. Slutsky's handout. We are just giving these things names based on their location. If their location changes, then their name changes. This is the exact same type of tissue. It's an areolar connective tissue, but here it's part of a serous membrane instead of a mucous membrane, and so we don't have a special name for it. There is a special name for it if it's part of a mucous membrane, but as part of a serous membrane, there's no special name for it. Instead, what gets the special name is the epithelial tissue. The epithelial tissue is called a mesothelium. So, and that's why I will use that term on the exam. Anytime I want one of these special names, like mesothelium, like perichondrium, like visceral peritoneum, I will use the term based on its location. And that tells you I am asking for one of these special names, like transudate, like mesothelium, like lamina propria. All right, these are special names we give things not because of what they are, but because of where they're located. Okay, so when you say the special names, never say simple squamous, correct? Correct, because that's a tissue type. Okay. Absolutely. So again, on this exam, uh, let's do this. Let's do this. Notice on this exam, if I point my arrow here, there is only one possible question I could ask. Identify this tissue type. However, if I point my arrow here, there are two questions I could ask. Identify this tissue type, identify this tissue based on its location. Okay, um, Professor, will you tell us if it's a serious membrane? No, you should recognize it by looking at it. Now, so here, we have a, here we have a simple illustration of this, but again, if, it's, if we're looking at an outside of the heart, if we're looking at the outside of the stomach or lining the cavity, if it's a location, because again, remember, we know where these serous membranes are. If you think about it, there are basically six specific, really, actually, that's not true. There are eight specific, um, there are eight specific uh, serous membranes, right? There is the visceral pericardium, parietal pericardium, visceral peritoneum, parietal peritoneum, right 
visceral pleura, right parietal pleura, left visceral pleura, left parietal pleura, right? There are eight possible specific serous membranes. And all of those are made up of a simple squamous epithelial tissue called a mesothelium. All of them have a real art connective tissue as their base. And all of them have a thin layer of serous fluid on them called a transudate based on their locations. All right. Questions on that? I warned you this part was dense. All right, excellent. So we took the break before we came to it. All right, if that's not confusing enough, now things get even more fun. Let's talk about a synovial membrane. Now, where did we say synovial membranes are found? Come on, hang with me, we're almost done. Space of the bone between two bones? Yeah, they cover uh, the free moving joints. Right, they're going to cover the free moving joints of the body. And guess what a synovial membrane does? Lubricates the joints. Yeah, it lubricates the joints. Now, the synovial membrane is also is like menisci. That would no, be an example. We'll get to the we'll get to the meniscus in a second, right? How does it lubricate the joint? It produces fluid. What, what do you think the name of that fluid is? Synovial. There you go, synovial fluid. Excellent. It forms a cavity that fills with this synovial fluid, right? And unlike our uh, serous membranes here, we want to fill the space with, oops, oops, if I spell space right, oops, if I spell space right, fill the space with synovial fluid. So it forms a cavity and it fills that space with synovial fluid, all right? So that is its job. That's what allows our joints to be, you know, move in that reduced friction environment. Now, as we mentioned, it is going to be lined with an epithelial tissue and a connective tissue. And what we've been able to do up to this period of time is we've been able to cheat and look at the picture. When we look at the picture, we can learn something about it. And notice when I look at the picture, especially the highlight, and I look at the red part, the red part is the epithelial tissue. But notice, here's a small cluster of cells, and here's a cluster of cells, and here's a cluster of cells, but they really don't have a distinct shape, and it's not a continuous layer. These synovial membranes are very special membranes. And that specialness makes them a little bit unique. One of the things that's unique about them is that they don't have a full complete epithelial tissue. Instead, what they really have are just these clusters of cells on the surface. Now we could say it's just a cluster of epithelial cells and that would be acceptable, but again, they like to give special names to things. So since it's really an incomplete layer, and that's the other way to think of it, it's an incomplete layer, they just call it a scant layer of cells. That means the same thing, incomplete layer, clusters of cells, however you want to describe it is fine, but it has an incomplete or scant layer of epithelial cells. And even the connective tissue is special. It is absolutely in a real art connective tissue, because as we've mentioned, we find that a real art connective tissue everywhere, but that a real art connective tissue has a massive number of fibers in it far more than a normal uh, real art connective tissue does. Remember, real art is typically a loose tissue. Well, this one has a massive number of fibers, so it has what we call a more extensive matrix to make it tougher, to make it more rigid, to give it more protection. All right? Now, as we mentioned, its job is to produce synovial fluid, and that synovial fluid is going to uh, reduce the friction and provide cushion inside of this joint. But what's interesting about this 
is that, and I'm gonna cheat and go small. If we filled this space with adipose, that would do the exact same thing. Adipose would be slippery. Adipose would be a cushion. But instead, what happens is we are, no, that's supposed to be tiny. Why is that? That would be, I'm gonna do that. Go to my drawing of the arrow. All right, let's try this one more time. All right, I don't know why I'm doing that, but I don't care. All right, I've given up. Um, it is going to constantly produce synovial fluid and then reabsorb that synovial fluid as well. Oh, I know why it's doing that. Hold on, let me clear those. Boom and boom. So now my arrows will be pretty. Excellent. It's constantly producing synovial fluid and that synovial fluid is constantly being reabsorbed by that synovial membrane. So clearly it must be doing something more than just lubricating the joint and cushioning the joint. And again, remember one of the things we talked about is the end of these bones are lined with hyaline cartilage. And remember that hyaline cartilage, as we talked about, is avascular. So the other thing that our synovial fluid does, not only does it lubricate our joints, but it also maintains the cartilage. It is gonna maintain that cartilage of the joint, providing oxygen and nutrients for that cartilage and maintaining that cartilage, removing the waste from it. So that's why it's constantly being circulated. Um, you may not have thought of it in those terms before, but you're aware of this because you hear all the time, and maybe it's happened to you, if a joint becomes injured, one of the things that happens is when you irritate that membrane, uh, that membrane produces more uh, synovial fluid, and the joint cavity swells, and you get this big swollen joint, and you get this restricted range of movement best thing to do at that period of time, like if it's the elbow, for instance, is to rest it, keep it immobile. So the more, the less you move it, the less synovial fluid you produce, and it can be absorbed and it can heal. Of course, if it's your fantasy quarterback and you want him to throw four touchdown passes for you, he's got to get out there and play. So what do they do? Does he sit on the sidelines and just rest for a day? What do they do if you have excess fluid in a joint? They drain it? They drain it. They stick a big gauge needle in there, <laughs> suck that extra fluid out, and now you got free range of that motion of that arm again. Sure, you've now damaged and irritated that synovial membrane even more, and so it's going to swell even more as a result of that, but that's hours from now. We don't care about what hours from now. All we care about is the here and now and scoring our touchdowns and getting the, the adoration of our fans and scoring millions of dollars and all the fun things like that. So, that again, tomorrow is a whole other day. We won't worry about that. So they just suck it out and then it becomes movable again. All right. Okay. You guys do get the sarcasm in all of these things, right? It's not quite as hard when we're not face to face. Okay, excellent. All right. But it does give us an understanding of how these things work. All right. Questions on that? So you said it's lined with uh, the hyaline cartilage? Yes. So this blue stuff that you're seeing here, freely moving joints, like the joints between your fingers or the joints of your shoulder, most of the bones where you have a free moving joint, the ends of the bones are lined with hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage provides some slipperiness, provides some cushion so that the bones aren't being damaged, but it's also avascular. So the synovial fluid helps to maintain it. Can you use it as a lubricating shot? That's a great question. I guess in very short term, you could theoretically inject um, synovial fluid into a joint and it might provide lubrication. There are two problems with that. If you were injecting it because that fluid is reabsorbed, it wouldn't stay there for a very long period of time. So if you were gonna do that, you'd have to do a lot of long-term uh, injections. And every time you inject that membrane, you're damaging that membrane, which scars it, which reduces its potential to produce its own fluid. So every time you injected it, you would be uh, damaging that membrane, it would be producing less lubricating uh, synovial fluid. And so you'd have to take those shots even more and more frequently. So uh, it, it, I, I don't, theoretically, it I think would work in a very short term, but it isn't in practicality a very uh, practical 
uh, function. I don't, I have, I don't believe anybody does anything like that. I thought they used cortisone shots for that. What cortisone does isn't uh, providing lubrication. What it does is it decreases the inflammation. And so by decreasing the inflammation, you produce less excess fluid and that decreases the fluid production in there. And again, that gets rid of the swelling. But that's also a steroid too, correct? Right, because steroids suppress the immune response, and so that stops the inflammation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Professor? Yes. So, like, uh, some, I don't know, like, some diseases, uh, if someone's, like, disabled, or they can't move their, like, fingers in mobility, does that mean they're, like, lacking hyaline cartilage, or? Uh, so, uh, yes and no. So, here's the short version. Um, we will talk about this in great deal when we get to the skeletal system and we talk about the joints. We will definitely talk about joint diseases and some of the functions and implications of that. Uh, it, it is kind of a vicious cycle that way. One of the things, and again, some of it can be disease, some of it can just be old age. As we age, one of the things that happens is our joints produce less synovial fluid. So you have less lubrication, less cushioning. And so what happens is you're more likely to damage the cartilage. And as we talked about, cartilage is avascular, so it doesn't heal properly. So some of that can cause inflammation. Some of that can cause the surfaces to be less smooth. So now they don't move as, as well against each other. And then that doesn't even include things like diseases, like you said, like auto or autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, which can cause actually your immune system to attack your synovial membrane and destroy it and build up all that scar tissue and stuff. So yeah, so we will absolutely talk about those things when we get to the skeletal system and the joints in metal detail. Thank you. Yep, great questions though. Love it, excellent, excellent. All righty, any other questions on synovial membranes? I had a quick question, it might be yep. slightly dumb, but is this the- The only stupid question is the question not asked. Gosh. All right, now what was your the question? terminology might be off, there we go. Um, would this be the fluid with, um, that they would inject if if there's something wrong with the vertebral discs and if there's no mobility there? Um, no, because those are not synovial. Well, there are some synovial joints, but usually when there's a lack of mobility, it has more to do with the uh, fibrocartilage that is, uh, you know, being compressed or, or a disc that is being dislodged or something like that. So no, that typically wouldn't be as useful in that location because yeah. those are not synovial joints. All right, and that was actually an excellent question. All right, any others? Yeah, remember our, our intervertebral discs are fibrocartilage, not hyaline cartilage. So it's a completely different type of joint. And again, we'll actually learn the specific type of joint when we get to the skeletal system. All right, what that leaves us with, we are doing excellent. All right, what that leaves us with is our last membrane, our cutaneous membrane. And what is the location of our cutaneous membrane? Guys are overthinking this. There you go. Well, careful. I would say the location is the outside surface of the body. But you are absolutely correct. Your skin is, whoops, oops, I spell it right. Your skin is your cutaneous membrane. Your cutaneous membrane is your skin. Essentially, you can use those two words interchangeably. Your cutaneous membrane is your skin, your skin is your cutaneous membrane. You can use those terms inter, uh, interchangeably. They mean the exact same thing, all right? So again, of course, that's the outer surface of the body. We'll talk in much more depth about the functions, but let's talk about a, uh, just a basic function. What is the basic function of the skin right now? Uh, to keep heat inside. Right, well, not just heat, but protection, absolutely. Protection from a lot of things. Protection from heat gain or loss, protection from water gain or loss, right? Protection from harmful environments, protection, and lots of other things too, right? It forms a protective barrier, absolutely. Excellent, right? What epithelial tissue forms our cutaneous membrane? Remember, what do you do to the skin? Kiss it. Oh, good. 
Keratinized. There you go, exactly. Keratinized. Stratified. Squamous. Epithelial. Tissue. Excellent, right? Kiss it. Keratinized, stratified, squamous, epithelial tissue. That is the epithelial tissue that lines the surface. Is there a special name for it? Yes, keratinized, stratified, squamous, epithelial tissue. Now, I know the question you're asking me, and the, um, yes, uh, we won't use the term uh, name based on location, but as you can see, when we talk about the skin, which is exactly where we're going next, the epithelial tissue of the skin forms what we also refer to as the epidermis. So when we talk about the skin, we will talk about the epidermis, and that epidermis is comprised of the epithelial tissue, the connective tissue, I'm pardon me, the, uh, the keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. All right. What connective tissues, plural, do you think comprise our base of our cutaneous membrane? Excellent. Well, again, because we can read, we know that, not surprisingly, notice areolar connective tissue is a part of every single membrane. Every single membrane has an areolar connective tissue as a base of it. But skin is special in that it actually has two connective tissues that make it up, areolar connective tissue, and as we also know, to resist those shearing multi-directional forces, we have that dense irregular connective tissue, which I can abbreviate because it's written out down there. Excellent. So there you go. And with that, that is the perfect lead in to, oops, uh, grab this, move it out of the way. Uh, what we need to do next, and what we need to do next is talk about chapter five. We are finally at the point where we are going to get to start to talk about our first organ system, the integumentary system. So there you go. A lot of vocabulary. This is very dense material. Notice this is material that easily could be essay questions on the exam. This is material that easily, I guarantee, will be questions on your uh, lab exam as well. So you need to know your membranes. You need to know the components of the membranes. You need to know all the names based on location. All right, questions on that. All right, as I warned, this material is a little bit dense. I would love to go ahead and finish for today, but we actually need to start our integumentary system so we limits how much material we have to cover tomorrow. So uh, we will take one last break. Let's make it a quick 10 minute break. Just a quick stretch, quick chance to pee, quick chance to uh, get a cup of coffee or something like that. But let's come back at 11.50 and at 11.50 we will restart. Quick question. Yes. Um, because the material is so dense, what like what have you found is the best way for students to kind of remember it all? Uh, so at this point, what I would say is really uh, there repetition. So the the short answer is time and repetition. One of the things that I think is very different about this class from any other class that most people have taken is the type of material you are responsible for. Like I said, what I like about this class is that this class is hard. And it's not hard because there's big confusing things in this class. If I give you a bone and I give you two hours with that bone, at the end of those two hours, you are gonna know absolutely everything about this, that bone. What's great about anatomy and physiology is each individual concept isn't what is hard. What is hard is the amount of information and the time you have to study it. Learning one bone in two hours is easy. The problem is you have 206 named bones. And the problem is you're gonna have a week and a half to learn it, all right? That's incredibly intimidating uh, to be able to do something like that. You're gonna have less than two weeks basically to learn all of that material. 
The other problem is it's the type of material. Uh, you know, when you take a, a non-science class, and I even throw chemistry into this mix as well, right? Like I said, uh, the information itself isn't hard. In two hours, you're going to own that bone. You could stare at a chemical equation for two hours or a physics proof for two hours and not be any closer to understanding it. So the, inf the good thing about A&P is the information is very straightforward. The problem is typically chemistry or psychology or other classes like that, a section of the class has like five big concepts. And as long as you understand those five big concepts, you're okay. So that's the kind of thing you could spend all day Sunday before an exam, cramming those big five concepts and boom, you're good to go. That's not what A&P is like. Instead of five big concepts, you have a hundred little concepts. And the problem is you can't sit there for 12 hours straight and learn a hundred little concepts. Because the problem is, is as you learn those tiny little things, by the time you reach hour three, you've forgotten everything from hour one already. So what you really need to do with this class is it's repetition. It's spreading the information out and using repetition to learn it. Now, how you repeat that is really up to you and your learning style. I tend to be a visual learner and a tactile learner. So things that are really useful for me are flashcards, right? Especially for identification stuff. I write my own flashcards. I know you can buy them. I know your, your master in A&P will make flashcards for you and that's fine. But being a tactile learner, often on a test when I recall the information, I actually recall writing the flashcard, not actually the studying it. Right, just as much as I remember studying it, so it's equal parts. So me writing out flashcards and then having those flashcards with me. One of the great things about flashcards, and again, back in ancient times, we used to be able to leave the house. I would leave a huge stack of them by the door. And at the beginning of the day, I'd take the top of that stack with me and keep it in my pocket. So every time I hit a red light, I would put them out. When I was standing in line at Starbucks or when I was standing in line at Safeway, I'd take them out and I would study them. And the other thing to remember about flashcards is study both sides of a flashcard. Too often, people look at the term and just try to think of what the definition is. But that isn't always how you're going to be tested on something, right? Sometimes look at the definition and think of the term, right? Sometimes read epithelial tissue or connective tissue and try to think of what they are from mucous membrane. Or sometimes look at the mucous membrane and try to think of what they are. So study flashcards on both sides. So uh, uh, other people, it's re-listening to the lecture slides. Other people, it's rewriting your notes for these things, right? Whatever it is, hopefully at this point, you figured out what can help you to be successful and what you're based on your learning style. And if you're not sure what your learning style is, there are plenty of websites where you can go to where you can take those tests that will tell you what your learning style is. If, if this was a normal semester, I would encourage you to go to the Students uh, Success Center. It's a great resource on campus where they actually do those kind of things. They're not there during the summer, so it doesn't help us. But uh, repetition, the more, one of the nice things about this class and their normal circumstances is it's a very linear progression. The more time you spend studying this in this class, the better you're going to do. It's really that simple. The problem is during summer, you get the information twice as fast and you have half the time to study it, right? Welcome to study summer school. So that's what I would say. Repetition is really the key to success for all of these really dense materials. When there's a lot of content, repetition is going to be the key. All right? Break it up into small, easily digestible pieces and repeat. All right? That's how you eat an elephant. Thank you. All right? How do you eat an elephant? Little by little. Yeah. One bite at a time. Exactly. One bite at a time. That's what this class is. This class is one bite at a time. All right. Excellent. I ranted for a while, so again, let's go ahead and still take our 10-minute break, come back at 11.55, and that'll give us uh, about 40 minutes to start our tissues, get our introduction to skin, so that we can really hit the ground running tomorrow, finishing off the anatomy, and then finishing off the physiology for that, doing all the physiology for that. So quick 10-minute break, like I said, just quick stretch, quick drink of water, uh, right, whatever it is you need to do to get yourself to the end of this class, and then we'll meet back here in 10 minutes. Let's finish this off. <clears throat> so what we need to do to finish off today is get started. Finally, we've laid that foundation uh, pretty quickly, but we've gotten it out there. Welcome to summer school. Uh, and we finally get to start talking about organ systems. 
And so that is our goal. And the first organ system we're going to talk about is the integumentary system. Now, this, of course, is an organ system. And in organ systems, typically we have two main types of organs or structures. We have the primary organs that are responsible for the main functions of that organ system. And then we have accessory structures or accessory organs that assist in those processes. So of course, in the integumentary system, what is the main organ of the integumentary system? This is on, right? You can hear me? Skin. Skin, there you go, excellent. It is indeed the skin, there you go, perfect. Our skin is the primary organ of the integumentary system. So what would examples of accessory structures be? What would an accessory structure be? Excellent, glands would be one example. What else? True, the, well the pores remember are the ducts of the glands as they leave, hairs, excellent. And there's one other big one. If you're not sure, look down at your skin. What else do you notice? Glands, hairs, and? Nails. Nails. Nails, there you go, excellent. Nails, perfect, excellent. So you've got your glands, you've got your hairs, you've got your nails, excellent. So those are the accessory structures, right? And when we put it all together, we see here that thing that you look down at and see that is your skin. There's a tremendous amount of hunk and junk going on inside of it. So we have to talk about and identify all of those things. Excellent. Now, the other thing we need to do when we talk about an organ system is we need to talk about the functions. Up to this point in time, we've been pretty generic about the functions, but now it's time to be specific. And as you can see here, there are many functions of the skin. So let's be more precise about it, what these functions are. So give me an example of a function of the skin. What's one of the things our skin does for us? Protection. Excellent. So one of the big ones, as we talked about, is protection. We said that before. Oops. But now we get the opportunity to be more precise. Protection from what? Ooh, that's a good way to put it. Pathogen. Excellent. One of the main things that protects us from is from pathogens, helping to keep harmful things outside, right? Water. And again, remember, as we talked about both water loss and water gain, as we talked about, we don't swell up like sponges when we take that bath. We also don't dehydrate as quickly when we are outside going for a walk in this warm weather. What else does it protect us from? UV radiation. Excellent, UV radiation. That UV radiation is the number one cause of all skin cancers. It can be very damaging to our cells and so it protects our, we protect our skin cells from it, but obviously our skin is protecting all the organs underneath from UV radiation as well. What else? Other harmful substances not just pathogens, but harmful substances, and from abrasion as well, All right? All right, from being scratched up or other abrasion, right? So there's all sorts of things that it is able to provide us protection for. Excellent, All right? Oh, I like that. It protects us from weather and cold, and someone already mentioned uh, temperature regulation. Excellent. Our skin helps us to provide protection from temp and maintain our temperature, our body temperature, regulate our body temperature. And we'll talk about some of the specific ways that it is able to do that. What else does our skin do for us? Doesn't it separate the outside world from the inside? Absolutely, it forms an important barrier, right? And that barrier helps to protect us from the outside world. Um, However, let's be careful about that. Is it a perfectly impenetrable barrier? No. No, right? It does allow some things in. Remember, kind of like our plasma membrane, it has somewhat selective permeability. 
However, in this case, it isn't so much that, actually, I'm going to go ahead and erase that. It isn't so much that it allows things in and out, but it does play a role in both absorption and secretion. I know this has never happened to anybody here in this classroom, but believe it or not, there are some individuals who in a single night will have more than one alcoholic beverage. I know you're all shocked by that bit of information, but there are some people who may have as many as four, five, 12 alcoholic beverages in a single evening. Like I said, I'm sure it's never happened to any of you, but maybe you've got a friend that that happened to. And when they wake up the next morning, right, and they're stumbling around the house, you can tell they've been drinking, not just from the breath, but maybe they're feeling a little guilty and they get on the treadmill and they start to sweat. And as they sweat, that alcohol will actually come out of their body. Like I said, I know it's never happened to any of you, but maybe instead, back in ancient times when you could go out for a nice fancy dinner, you went out to a nice Italian restaurant and had the 30 garlic chicken. And then again, the next day, feeling a little guilty, you get on that treadmill. And when you start to sweat, that garlic can come out of your pores as a result of that. All right. Or maybe instead, you've been a chronic smoker and you want to stop. What's the way, one of the ways you can stop that? A, a nicotine patch? Yeah, a patch. You put a patch of medication on the outer surface of your skin, and that medication is absorbed through the surface of the skin. Right? We do that for chronic pain. We do that for medications. There are some birth controls that are patches now that you can just set it and forget it, things along those lines. So while it is absolutely a barrier to the outside world, it also provides some absorption and some secretion as well. So it's not completely impenetrable. What else? I can think of at least two more things our skin does for us. Excellent. One of the things that it does is the synthesis of vitamin D. Excellent. It only takes about 15 minutes of sunlight. Right, 10 to 15 minutes of sunlight is enough. We, inside our skin, we have a special cholesterol. And that cholesterol, when exposed to UV radiation, produces vitamin D. Why is vitamin D so important? Anyone know? Helps to improve in the bone health, right? Excellent. And specifically, it does that by it helps in the absorption Oops, oops, I spell absorption right. Absorption of calcium. You can drink a whole cow's worth of milk. If you don't have the active form of vitamin D in your body, you're not going to be able to absorb the calcium from it. Now, again, notice what I said. UV radiation changes that cholesterol in our body, and we're all scared of UV radiation. Right, so we don't go outside where we wear sunscreen or we have the umbrella in the long sleeve. So luckily, it's almost impossible to buy milk now that doesn't have vitamin D in it. Right, so we, have, we can get our vitamin D now from our, uh, right, uh, from our um, diet. Uh, we absorb it that way, and then that's then converted and used to absorb calcium that way. Excuse me, Professor? Yes. Is it true that um, morning sunlight is better than afternoon sunlight? Um, so uh, what, here's what I would say is it, uh, the sunlight that travels to you has to travel through the, uh, atmosphere to get to you. And when the sun is rising or the sun is setting, it is coming at a more oblique angle and has to travel through more of the atmosphere. So more of the UV radiation is absorbed. Whereas, uh, you know, between like 10 and 2, when the sun is directly above you overhead, it is able to more directly penetrate the atmosphere. And so less of the UV radiation is absorbed. So it can be more uh, potentially damaging in the middle of the day than in the morning or at the end of the day. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily more helpful, more beneficial. I would just say it's less potentially damaging. But it also depends on your environment, right? If you go skiing for the weekend, right? Again, all that white snow reflects all that light. So even if you're up there in the morning, all that reflected light is going to double basically your exposure. And so again, it's not it's not perfect, but but yes, it, it, there is a little potentially less damaging earlier or later in the day because it has to pass through more of the atmosphere. 
Excellent. All right. I can think of one more good one. What's the last important function of your skin? Do you guys, ah, oh, there's that one I was looking for, cutaneous sensation. Right. We receive massive amount of information from our skin. Your temperature, pain, tickle, itch, fine discrimination, right? Uh, the feel of your shirt on your shoulders, your chair on your back or your butt, your socks on your feet. Right, all of those are sensations that are constantly bombarding your brain. Most of the time you're ignoring that information, but we receive a massive amount of information from our skin, absolutely. So it is our uh, most important cutaneous right, touch organ, absolutely. So we've done it here on the board. Let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Again, protection from physical, chemical, and biological barriers, it provides that temperature regulation, provides that cutaneous sensation, pressure, pain, itch, tickle, discrimination, all of those things. Excretion and absorption, right? Wastes out, lipids in, uh, and synthesis of vitamin D. Excellent, 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 perfect. All right, questions on that? All right, so what we need to talk about now is the anatomy. When we talk about the anatomy of the skin, remember as we talked about at the very beginning of the class when we were talking about making organs, organs are made of two or more tissues put together. And as we said, our skin is essentially made up of two types of tissues put together, an epithelial tissue on top of what we now know are two connective tissues, and they form our skin. We know it is a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, we know it is in a real art connective tissue and a dense regular connective tissue. But as we mentioned, these layers of tissues also have fancy names as well. The epithelial tissue forms our epidermis and the connective tissues form what is known as the dermis, right? So as we talked about, the skin is the largest organ of the body. The study of it is the field of dermatology. And the skin consists of two parts or two general layers. Those two general layers are the epidermis, the superficial layer. And as we talked about, it is our keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And the dermis, which are the two deep layers. And as we talked about, that is the areolar and the dense irregular connective tissue. Those are the tissues that make them up. Now, there is another layer that is associated with the skin, but is not a part of the skin. Our hypodermis is associated with the skin, but not a part of it. That hypodermis or subcutaneous layer both are appropriate names for them, is comprised of realar and adipose connective tissue. Now again, part of that depends on the location. As we said, in areas like our belly, uh, in our uh, chests, uh, in our butt, there may be more adipose and less realar. But even here, where there may not appear to be any fat, uh, there is still some adipose and a realar connective tissue as well. And even if you're one of those distance runners, one of those, uh, those um, you know, ultra marathoners who get down to one and a half percent body fat, they still have that a real art connective tissue in there as well. Now this hypodermis is very important and it helps the skin, but again, it is not a part of the skin. How does it help the skin? What does our hypodermis do for us? Well, as we talked about, it can provide insulation, it can provide protection. But here's the other thing as well. Let's think of it this way. Halloween is right around the corner. All right, I know it's not really not, but let's pretend it is. And I'm sure like you, uh, I have my favorite Halloween costume. When all else fails and I can't think of anything fun, I put on my purple shorts, I paint my entire body green, and I run around outside as the Incredible Hulk. And it looks awesome for like the first 10 minutes. But then as the paint dries, every time I move my body, what ends up happening? It if cracks. Put, well, if you put paint on the surface of your body and then that paint dried and then you moved, what would happen to the paint? It would crack, right? 
The reason for that is your muscles change shape as you move them. In fact, that's where they get their name. Muscles comes from the Greek word mice because it looks like little mice running around underneath the surface of the skin, right? Now they change shape. And as they change shape, if, I, if the skin was like that paint, just flat, directly connected to the muscle, every time you moved, it would put tremendous stress on that skin. And like the paint, it could crack and it could tear. And our skin needs to provide protection, so we don't want it tearing like that. So what our hypodermis does is it loosely connects the skin to the muscle. That allows the muscles to change shape underneath without putting too much stress on the skin itself. So it definitely helps to assist the skin and stores energy, protects our organs, uh, helps us to insulate our body to maintain temperature. It has important functions, but it's not a part of the skin. All right, its job instead is to loosely connect the skin to the muscle underneath. All right, so when we look at the pretty pictures, uh, and let's cheat and go back a picture, right here we see that adipose underneath. This adipose is actually part of the hypodermis, not a part of the skin. In fact, it's in the name, subcutaneous layer. Subcutaneous means under the cutaneous membrane. And as we know, the cutaneous membrane is your skin. If you're under the skin, you can't be a part of the skin. All right. Now, we need to identify and describe the components of the skin. And we are going to start first with the epidermis. And like all tissues, as we said, it's a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And like all epithelial tissues, it is cell dense. And in fact, there are four main types of cells that are going to form our skin, our epidermis of our skin. The first and by far the most common, making up more than 99% of the cells of our skin are keratinocytes. Guess what a keratinocyte does? Produce keratin? Yeah, exactly. It's gonna produce keratin. Remember, as we said, our skin, oops, our skin is a keratinized stratified squamous because it has massive amounts of keratin in it. And that's what keratinocytes do. Keratinocytes make keratin. Now, the process is obviously a little more uh, uh, elaborate than that. It actually produces these granules called keratohyalin granules. And these granules are assembled to form the functional protein that is keratin. Keratin's job is to make the skin hard, to provide that protection. So the skin is this hard and protective outer barrier. But remember, we also need it to be fused together. We also need it to be mostly waterproof. So the other thing these keratinocytes produce is a second type of granule, what is called a lamellated granule. This lamellated granule is kind of like the turtle wax of the cells. This is going to help to hold the cells together, fusing the cells together into a single layer, and it also waterproofs the cells. Now, question? Yes. Uh, for exam purposes, do we need to go into specific details like this? If I ask you for the function of the keratinocytes, you need to say, I would accept keratin. If you said produce keratin, that would be fine. But you also need to say that it produces lamellated granules as well. OK. Because these lamellated granules are equally important. They would make the skin waterproof. They would help diffuse the cell layers together, right? making that protective barrier. And it also, if you think about it, tells you what happens to your cells. Your keratinocytes basically fill themselves up with keratin so much keratin that they're like, you know what? I don't need this nucleus in these organelles anymore. And they chuck the nucleus in organelles. They also then basically waterproof themselves and fuse themselves to the, the cells next to them. And if you're surrounded and fused and waterproofed, can you get oxygen and nutrients easily to the cell? Can you get rid of wastes very easily? 
No, and even if you could get oxygen and nutrients, do you have a nucleus or organelles to make the proteins you need or to repair yourself? No. So what do we know about the superficial layers of our skin? They're dead. They're dead. They're dead, hardened cells fused together, helping to form that protective barrier. So the superficial layers of keratinocytes are dead, flat, hard cells squished together, fused together, to help to provide that protective barrier. Excuse All right. me. Yes. I don't know if this is going to be confusing, but um, so a keratin is an intermediate filament, right? Yes. So based on the, um, it's an intermediate filament based on its location, you call it a keratin? No, so keratin uh, is the protein. Keratin is the protein. Remember, when we talked about intermediate filaments, we said they could be comprised of different types of proteins. Oh, okay, okay. Here in these cells, the intermediate filaments are made up of the protein keratin. Okay. In this case, that keratin makes them very tough and very uh, rigid. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, no, great question. Not confusing at all. Helps to undo the confusion, so I appreciate that. Excellent, now, as I mentioned, more than 99% of the cells of the skin are keratinocytes. So again, if you were to throw a dart at the skin, it would hurt. But also the cell you would most likely hit would be a keratinocyte. But there are a few other cells that hope, help in important functions. One of them is a melanocyte. We talked about these briefly before. What did we say the melanocytes do again? Use melanin. They produce melanin, excellent. And what is melanin again? Pigment that gives the color to the skin. Exactly, it is the pigment of the skin. These melanins give our skin pigment. One of the really interesting things about melanocytes is every single person in this class, and in fact, in your households, in this city, on this state, we all have the same number of melanocytes. All right. But even in a class as small as this one, while we, we may all have the same number of melanocytes, do we all have the same coloration to us? I know almost everybody has their cameras off right now, but there have been enough times where everybody's been on where do we have the same coloration to our skin? No. 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 And the reason for this is twofold. While we all have the same number of cells, there are two ways that our cells differ. They differ in how much melanin they produce, and they differ in the, excuse me, color of the melanin produced. There have, are at least four genes that have been identified that play a role in skin color. And each of those genes have at least two versions of the gene. One making a lighter color pigment, one making a darker color pigment. So if you think about it, if all four of those all had the lighter version, you would produce a very light colored pigment. So even if you produced a lot of it, your skin wouldn't have a lot of coloration to it. Those people tend to be more pale in color and they don't tend to tan very well. Others uh, may have the all dark versions of them, giving a very dark or black coloration to the skin, right? And, and most people fall somewhere in between. We all have this massive variation. But again, which of the colors you make and how much of it you make are controlled genetically. So if I had two identical twins, would they be completely identical in their coloration? No. Why not? Because it depends uh, where they live. Part of it would be dependent on where they live or just what they did, right? If you had twins and one of them spent all their time outside on the skateboard and the other one spent all their side inside playing Fortnite, are they going to have same colorations to their skin? No. No. Even because their genes are identical, the other major factor that determines how much melanin we produce is exposure to the sun. The reason for this is our melanocytes job is to protect the keratinocytes. These melanocytes are located in the deepest layers of the skin, of the epidermis, I should say, right? Here, let me remove that. Notice they have these big long processes that take them out uh, by the keratinocytes. 
And what they do is they produce that melanin and they give that melanin to the keratinocytes so that it can take that uh, melanin and use it to form a barrier that protects that cell's nucleus from UV radiation, limiting the chance of damage or exposure. The one major concern from this is while this melanocyte produces all this melanin to protect the keratinocytes, it doesn't keep any of the melanin for itself. Instead, it relies on the fact that it is deep and can be protected by the keratinocytes for its protection. But if exposed to UV radiation, these can be damaged. And when a melanocyte becomes damaged, right, if in just the right or really in just the wrong way, what happens as a result of that? It can produce like um, corrupt, uh, yeah. how do you call it? Them? Become a cancer. Yeah. Right? Become cancer. So what kind of cancer involves the melanocytes? Melanomas, right? And again, not that anyone wants any type of skin cancer. But if you had to have a skin cancer, would be melanoma be the one that you would pick? Yes. That's really? Cool. You want it over quickly? I thought melanoma was a, the most. That's the hardest. That's the yeah. most killing, right? Exactly. Melanomas are the most aggressive and the most likely to spread of all of them. In fact, in some instances, people die within months of being diagnosed with melanomas. So melanomas are by far the worst of all of the skin cancers. So but is that, that's just in the skin? It doesn't uh, attack organs or blood or? Something. No, that's the problem with melanomas. Melanomas will metastasize and will spread to other parts. They can spread to the heart, they can spread to the liver, they can spread to the lungs, they can spread to the brain, they can spread all over the place. It is a very aggressive and very rapidly spreading type of cancer. And that spreads through the Blood, I'm assuming. Typically through the blood, yes. Blood, yes. All right, excellent. Here is the second type of cell. The second type of cell is what is known as an epidermal cell or epidermal dendritic cell. It is also known as a Langerhans cell. And of course, why is it called the Langerhans cell? Because that's who discovered it. Exactly. Good old Bob Langerhan was the very first person who identified and described it. So he's the one who planted his name in it. These are skin cells, but these skin cells actually are more closely related to white blood cells than they are to the keratinocytes. And like some of our white blood cells, these dendritic cells have two main functions. One is they contain histamine. What did we say histamine did again? Anti-inflammatory, or no, inflammatory response. Yeah, it causes inflammation. If you happen to be out camping and you rub yourself with poison oak or poison ivy, one of the things that happens is you get this red rash that shows up on, the, on, your, on your skin, right? Some people can just scratch themselves and they get little red welts as a result of that because you're stimulating those Langerhans cells, causing that inflammation to occur. So it causes inflammation. The other things being white blood cells, they can act as phagocytes. They can find a harmful pathogen and endocytose it and break it down and destroy it. So they play a very important role in helping to protect our body, protecting us from outside things and when injured to let us know by having that inflammatory response. So they're very important that way. The fourth type of cell we find in the skin are what are known as tactile cells. Now tactile cells are also called Merkel discs. And of course, why are they called Merkel discs? As the person who invents, found out yeah, exactly. He didn't invent them, but you're absolutely right. Good old Bob Merkel was the first one who described these, drew a picture of them, he planted his flag in it, and they named it after them. Question? Um, yes. The, the, you said dendritic, right? They, these are in the hypodermis? No, these are in, all of these, all of these are cells of the epidermis. Epidermis, right. However, you did remind me of an important fact that I didn't mention. Unlike the other cells of the epidermis, these cells, the epidermal cells, can actually migrate between the layers. 
of the epidermis. So they can actually kind of move their way through the epidermis of the skin. Again, they're the patrolmen running around looking for that harmful thing. And when they find something harmful, they release the histamine, they try to gobble it up, they raise the alarm to let the body know that it is under attack. All right. That brings us to our last type of cells, the tactile cells. These tactile cells give us a tactile sensation, but really we want to be more specific. They provide fine discrimination. One of the activities that your textbook talks about doing that you could do with you on, again, it's not one of the activities that I'm requiring you to do, but especially if you have little kids at home, it's one of those fun activities you can do. What you can do is take a paper clip, and with that paper clip, you can bend it out to form two points. And what you can do with those two points is you could touch those two points to the skin at the same time and ask them if they feel one point or two points. And what you could do is you can either squeeze them together to make them one point, or you could do them both at the same time for two. And what you'll find is your ability to tell the difference between two and one is better on places like your hand than it is on your forearm or the small of your back. We do this with little kids all the time. The little kid, you draw a letter on their back and you ask them what it is and they have to try to struggle to figure that out. If you did it on their hand, it'd be super easy. But we have fewer of these fine discrimination things on our back than we do on our hand, the palms of our hand, right? In fact, uh, these are very, very good in this area, finding this fine discrimination. If you had a pocket full of quarters, I mean a pocket full of change, you could reach into your pocket and pull out just the quarters. One way you could do that by the size, but the other way you could do it is quarters have those ridges on the edges. That ability to fill the ridges on the edges is what that fine discrimination does, right? These are distributed throughout the body, but not equally. Where do we have the most? Hands. Excellent, so again, I already said hands. Feet. Not the feet, although that is a good guess. Face? Face, exactly. We have most of them on our hands, especially the thumb, on our face, especially the lips. And again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but you're aware of it. Because if you've ever been around a baby, what do babies love to do? Mm. Yeah, well, they love to grab things. And what do they do once they grab things most of the time? Put it in their mouth. Shove it in their mouth, exactly. That's how they explore the world. They're exploring the world with their hands and with their mouth because that's where a lot of these tactile cells are located. That is where we explore the world with these areas, with those tactile cells, providing that fine discrimination. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. All right, finish off with one last thing. So we're gonna talk about our epithelial tissues and we're gonna take these cells now and arrange them into layers. With your skin, you basically have two types of skin, thin skin and thick skin. Where do we have our thin skin? Our forearm. Yeah, forearm, where else? Chest, scalp, back. Most of our skin is thin skin. Let's ask the easier question. Where's your thick skin? Bottom of the feet and hands. Yeah, palms of the hands, soles of the feet, right? Now, one of the big differences between your thin skin and your thick skin is your thick skin has five distinct strata or layers of cells, whereas your thin skin just has four distinct layers of cells. Is there any other big difference between your thick skin and your thin skin? If you're not sure, look at the palm of your hand and look at the back of your hand. Notice any differences? Keratin. True. The amount of keratin is going to be thicker on the thick skin. That's why it's called thick skin. What else? It has multiple layers. Well, it does have more layers, but can you really see that as you look at it with your eyes? No. No. What do you notice when you look it's at it with your eyes? Say again? Veins? Uh, you may be able to see the veins more on the back than on the front. It depends. What else? 
Yeah. You guys are overthinking this. What's the look at the front of your hand? It's look lighter. Right. More uh, more ridges. Lighter color, maybe more ridges. How about hair? Do you have hair in both locations? No. no. Thin skin has hair. Thick skin does not have hair. No matter what activities you are participating in home, no hair is going to grow in this region of your hand. Thick skin, palm of your hand, soles of your feet is hairless skin. So it's thick. It has all those other characteristics, but it also is hairless as well. All right. Now here we have thick skin showing the five layers. We'll see the four layers in just a minute. What we have here is this up here at the top is superficial. And this down here is deep. We can see that because down here is the dermis and we know the dermis is deep even though we can't really see the top. However, what I will say is as we go through the skin and while most people talk about the skin, when they talk about the skin, we do it from, oh, that's not gonna work at all. When we talk about the skin, we talk about it from superficial, uh, from deep to superficial. Because down here at the base is where we grow the cells and then they migrate upwards. So as we learn about it, we will start deep. And as we start deep, we will then go superficial as we go through the layers, both four for the thin skin and five for the thick, thick skin. So that is where we will pick up tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will talk about the five uh, layers of the epithelial tissue of the epidermis, identifying the layers, uh, talking about what happens in those layers and the differences between thick and thin skin. All right, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. Thank you very much. I know today was long, but by going further today, we have less to do tomorrow. So that will help us make sure we cover everything that needs to be covered. All right, if nothing else, be happy, be healthy, be safe. I will see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yes. Uh, which which uh, lecture we need to uh, submit uh, this week? Just the skin color? So the skin color was due today, but again, like I said, I will like, still accept it uh, late tomorrow, uh, by okay. tomorrow, because after that, remember, like I said, I will start doing... Um, uh, you were docking people points for things being late. And then unit five is due today as well. Tomorrow, you have three things due. Uh, your unit six review, uh, your epithelial tissue and connective tissue handouts with their drawings and okay. labels, those are due. And then also okay. the fingerprint activity are due. So you have three things okay. due tomorrow. All okay. right. Okay. Excellent. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.